Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, August 8th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm uh, Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the school committee, and we'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll. Mayor David Narkowitz? Present. Ms. Molly Burnham? Present. Ms. Rebecca Bisansky? Here. Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? <clears throat> Present. Mr. Downey Meyer? Present. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Mr. Moss? Present. Mr. Yeah. Edward Tahoski? Present. Thank you very much. So we begin our meeting as we do um, each time with a public comment period. I don't know if we have anyone signed up at the public comment. Um, okay, so there's no one who's signed up. Um, is there anyone who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, um, so hearing none, um, we will then um, move to the next item on the agenda, uh, which is a request for an executive session accept a motion to um, to do move into executive session. Make a motion to move into an executive session. Request for the executive session under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Northampton Association of School Employees, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect and further details would compromise the reason for going into a second session. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay. So um, uh, this requires a roll call vote. Um, so I will ask the clerk to call a roll call. Um, those voting in the affirmative are voting to move into executive session. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Yes. Mr. Danny Meyer? Yes. Mr. Howard Moore? Yes. Susan Boss? Yes. Mr. Edward Zahowski? Yes. Mayor David Narkwood? Yes. Ms. Molly Burnham? Yes. Ms. Rebecca Busansky? Yes. Ms. Laura Fallon? Yes. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Yes. Motion passes. So I just need to announce to the public that we we will move into executive session right now um, because to have this discussion in open session would be detrimental to our bargaining position. We will then return to open session um, from the executive session uh, when we conclude the executive session uh, period. So um, hold tight and we'll be back. Thank you. So this is the Thursday, August 8th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, the school committee has just come back into open session from executive session. Um, and we're actually going to uh, take an item out of order on our agenda. Um, it was uh, scheduled to be item C under reports and uh, recommendations. Um, be because it's central to what we were just discussing in executive session, um, we're going to take that up now. Um, and I would turn to the chair of our negotiating committee to uh, make a motion to put this on the floor. So I'd make a motion that we ratify the tentative agreement between the Northampton Public Schools and Northampton Association of School Employees as previously presented to the school committee in executive session. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. So the motion's been made and seconded. Um, and I believe the superintendent is going to give us a brief uh, overview for the public of, the, um, of uh, some of the key aspects of the successor agreement that we are taking a vote on ratification. Thank you. Um, these, I think, are the, the main provisions. Um, I was able to inform you about all the provisions in executive session. First, um, it's a three-year contract covering the period of July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2022. All gender binary language is removed from the CBAs. 10-month employees who've worked for the district for over three years have the option to be paid over 10 months instead of 12 months. Um, based on the ratification date, the likely ratification date um, by NACE, this would be something that would have to go into effect for the second year because we're setting up payroll right now for the first year of this agreement. A reopener um, of the contract in years two or three, if there's an annual increase in state education aid to the city, according to the following formula, chapter 70 aid plus school transportation plus charter tuition reimbursement plus smart growth reimbursement plus school choice receiving tuition minus school choice sending tuition minus charter sending tuition if the um, sum of that whole number is 
represents a five-year increase from year to year in year two or year three of the agreement. Five percent. Five percent. Sorry, five percent. That would trigger a reopener. Um, the agency fee language is stricken from all agreements in accordance with the Janus decision, and um, there's a withdrawal of any uh, pending litigation. So, um, going to the units, unit A, teachers unit, the uh, main financial package is a 3% COLA in year one with a 3% additional top step, 3% COLA in year two with a 2% additional top step, a 3% COLA in year three with a 2% uh, additional top step with step movement um, delayed until the 22nd day of school. In, I'm sorry, 92nd. 92nd day <laughs> of school in each year. Um, the rest of the changes to Unit A are rather minor, except I do want to talk about flex block language um, because I know that's been a topic of some discussion. The, uh, there is language in the tentative agreement that talks about implementation of flex block at JFK and the high school for a one year school wide trial in 20. 20 and 2021 school year. Um, at this point, it's felt that it's too late in the summer to try to set up for a flex block for the first year of the agreement, so that's delayed until the second year. There is a JLMC scheduled to meet during the first year to continue to work on the plans for implementation of the flex block in year two, and then the JLMC will continue to meet in year two um, to assess how the flex block is working and make recommendations for any um, continuing changes to that in year three of the, of the agreement. Moving on to, uh, I guess I, I should say also with all of the units, there is uh, a slight change in the bereavement language saying that the bereavement days um, should be tied to the services rather than tied to the death. Um, so that is reflected in unit A as well as all of the units. For unit B, this is the administrators. It's a 2% COLA in year one with a 2.5% additional step, a 2% COLA in year two with a 2.5% additional step, and a 2.5% COLA in year three with a 2.5% additional step. There's also a $900 credit for administrators with 30 credits beyond their master's degree. For ESPs, there's an extraordinary stipend that is currently in the contract for um, approximately 70 employees who do work that is considered above and beyond the typical ESP assignment. These are things like assisting with toileting, personal hygiene, feeding, restraint, etc. Um, that that extraordinary stipend now is 25 cents. That is eliminated in the, the new agreement and part of that is to support increases in COLAs and additional steps. So in year one the COLA is 4% with an additional 2.5% step. In year two the COLA is 3% with an additional 2.5% step. In year three the COLA is 3% with an additional 2.5% step. Other significant change is summer time pay. Um, regardless of where ESPs fall on the pay scale, they all receive a flat fee for summer work, much like teachers all receive a flat hourly fee for summer work. Their um, summer time wage is increased to $18 an hour. There also is the institution of an ESP to teacher career ladder. This is one of our strategies to help diversify our educator workforce and it's an outgrowth of our work with the Diverse Teachers Workforce Coalition which was um, a collaboration of the five colleges, Amherst Regional School District, Northampton Public Schools, Holyoke and Springfield Public Schools. Um, in the course of that work we found that one of the most diverse units that all the districts have are the ESPs and many of them in all of the districts already have bachelor's degrees. So they're very close to obtaining potential teacher um, licensure. So um, 
the, the strategy that was identified um, through the workforce was to try to support um, support the tuition of ESPs because that's a real barrier for them. So under this agreement, up to five ESPs per year would be supported um, to take coursework at the Collaborative for Educational Services, leading to their licensure in, as a teacher of moderate special needs. Next is clerical unit. Um, the clerical unit, there is no way to describe a, a simple COLA formula because what's happening with the clerical unit is the school, um, the school wage schedule for clerks is being aligned to the city's schedule. So basically identical schedule um, to what was implemented in the city. Um, there is additional um, stipend for, or an increase in the bilingual stipend for bilingual clerks. There is also um, a stipend for an additional $15 for work alone pay for a half day and $30 for work alone pay for a full day. Custodians similarly um, don't have a COLA formula. They, their um, grids are being dropped and instead grids that are consistent with the city grids for custodians are being implemented into the contract. Um, there is a small change with sick time, um, but that's essentially it for custodians. Cafeteria workers, 3% COLA with a new 2.5% step in year one, a 3% COLA with a new 2.5% step in year two, a 3% COLA with a new 2.5% step in year three. Um, there are also some uh, incidental things. I think probably the only other thing of substance is a change in out-of-grade pay. Um, currently, out-of-grade pay begins after three consecutive days. Um, in the new agreement, the out-of-grade pay would begin immediately from the time that the individual works out of grade, but at a different rate than it currently is. So those are the, um, the main outline of the provisions of the tentative agreement that I would recommend the school committee to support. Thank you, uh, Dr. Carlos. Um, uh, does anyone on the committee want to add anything to that? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to actually, um, I'd like to move to postpone this vote until our next meeting okay. um, based on uh, Based on our, our looking at the um, unit A tentative language, I'd like to have that settled. Um, and I'd, I'd be happy for that to be a special meeting prior to the start of the school year. I understand it's important to have the implementation in place. I just think that's a very significant issue. Um, we had one error in the tentative agreement, which we were able to quickly uh, remedy in the unit B contract. And I just I don't want ambiguity here um, in what's uh, a potentially uh, very important article uh, to come up later. I think it would be prudent for us to postpone and then come back and ratify it once we've clarified it. I think it will be quickly clarified with our bargaining um, partners, but i just like to do that first. And could you provide, um, hmm, I don't know if you're allowed to provide any detail to the school committee about that, about what the con concern is or the discrepancy? Yeah, it's 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 in the, the you know the unit A um, step movement. I just wanted to make sure, I just want to make sure that the language of the tentative agreement, um, if if it could be read as being ambiguous, that it's clarified prior to moving forward. Um, I think that the, uh, we had the assistance of the mediator. I think that we have other documents that show what our understanding was. I just think that it would be prudent to have that clarified prior to going forward. And again, I'm I'm. You know, if, if we need to have a special meeting and call the school committee back in, um, you know, e even prior to ratification by, by NACE, um, you know, I would hope the school committee would be available to do that. I certainly would be. So I um, just want to be clear. So you're making a motion at this point? Make, yeah, a motion to postpone. Okay. Um, this would be to our next meeting. Um, of course, it needs a second. Okay. Or a special meeting to be called. Right, or a, yeah, to whatever our next meeting is. Okay. Um, 
before you make the motion, uh, I just is there a second to that motion? Is what I we need to before. Right, we, yeah, there has to even be a second before it can be discussed. For conversation. I will second. It. Oh, for purposes. Okay, Ms. Uh, Boss. Um, I want to offer a conversation about that and ask if it would work to vote to ratify all of it except for the part that you just suggested. I think I think we'd still. I mean, I guess we could, um, and then that would just leave us again coming back to to deal with that particular issue. Okay. So there's a motion made and seconded on that. Um, hmm. Interesting. Yes. I think I don't. I don't know if you can be any more specific about what the concern is, or if we should go into executive yeah, session. But I'm not sure I'm understanding what the. Well, concern my is. my concern is when there's ambiguity and an agreement, that that. And and you know, two parties, um, two parties have have signed the agreement. Um, you could you could say, well, everyone knows what it means. And that when it's reduced or when it's integrated into the collective bargaining agreements, it will be integrated as understood. Mm -hmm. um, I I feel like that's not a prudent course. I feel like when you have ambiguity on a very significant term, you should deal with the ambiguity. Um, uh, you know, I think the same the same thing happened. You know, in the Article B language, where there was basically um, what you could describe as a you know an, an error of an error of document. Transfer of information, and you know we dealt with that quickly. Um, there was a back and forth between the superintendent uh, and the president of NACE and the head of their bargaining team, and it was it was quickly, quickly dispatched. So I, you know, again, um, I could just go with it, and my instinct is telling me not to go with it because it's a, it's potentially something that if you um, if you ratify and then the parties disagree, well, then you've ratified a, you ratified a something with ambiguity, and when you ratify something with ambiguity, um, it's read against you. Um, so I just, I feel like if, if we feel like there's ambiguity that we should, uh, we should dispatch it before ratifying. And I, Ms. Voss's suggestion, you know, I could modify my motion to ratify, to ratify everything except the article dealing with the uh, Unit A step movement. So would you be uh, would you be willing to uh, modify that? Yeah, I mean, I would modify my motion to um, ratify the agreement as presented to the school committee, with the exception of the Unit A salary and wages provision. Okay. So, um, will the seconder is? Do you have a question, Sam? I'm. I'm yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really lost. Okay. I feel like I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't even know what I'm voting on right now. Yeah. So yeah. from there yeah. to here, yeah. something happened, and I either need more specifics or executive I agree. session. I agree. So why don't? What I, I think it would be helpful to to go back into executive agree. session quickly because it's obviously challenging to be able to um, talk about negotiations again in open session. So. Okay. So I'll withdraw my motion and um, request an executive session under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Northampton of Association of School Employees, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect, and further details would compromise the reason for going into executive session. Second. Okay. I need a roll call vote on that. Okay. Um, Mayor David Narkowitz? Yes. 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 So we will be moving back into executive session. Uh, we will come back to open session as soon as we can complete the discussion.
So uh, welcome back to the Thursday, August 8th, 2019 Northampton School Committee. The school committee is returning again from executive session um, and we will resume our public discussion of the item that was uh, before the school committee, uh, which is um, item C under reports and recommendations uh, regarding the successor collective bargaining agreement. And I will turn to the chair um, to, uh, to make a m another motion okay um i i'd like to um, postpone consideration of the tentative agreement until a special meeting to be scheduled next week um and if there's a second i would explain second why. second uh, okay second. so in reviewing the tentative agreement um one thing that we were trying to get this done uh on the evening when we concluded completed negotiations and get it signed by both sides uh, so that we could continue the momentum forward and get this implemented prior to the beginning of the school year. Um, when we did that that night, we actually, um, due to transfer of information, had left off a half percent uh, on the COLA for the third year of the Unit B uh, part of the con or Unit B contract. And it took a day. Uh, communications directly between the superintendent and uh, the superintendent passed that information on to me and it was uh, settled with the president of NACE. Um, in, in reviewing this document, uh, a, a question was raised about, again, a, a missing um, letter and I think that it's prudent for us to uh, return after we've done gone through the same process. I believe the superintendent would be able to reach out tomorrow to the NACE president and that we would be able to settle this. and, and put it to bed before we go forward. Um, so that's why I'm making this motion this time. Okay. Um, are there any uh, questions about that or any further discussion about that? Um, okay. So all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the motion carries. And again, uh, we will be in immediate communication to try to resolve that uh, uh, what we believe is a Scribner's error, and um, and then try to get a special meeting uh, uh, scheduled next week, so next we week. can get the ratification complete. Yeah. So thank you. Okay, so um, we're returning now to the regular order of the agenda, and we have item four on the agenda, which is announcements. Are there any announcements? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Our, we'll just allow our two colleagues to return to the dais, um, <laughs> who have. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Mr. Kaufman. Well, you said you had an announcement, so I was. I, All right. Um, you, you thank you. Um, so, a couple of things I wanted just to bring up for um, members of the public as well as for us. Um, as many of you might know, there's a our charter review commission going on now in Northampton. I, I've kind of looked back at some of the videos and notes, and I've actually enjoyed, and uh, I've enjoyed watching them and. What I've, what I've learned is that they are um, seeking greater input. I think that's something which um, we can all probably value. So I thought I'd just tip my hat to them and tell you that there's a commission going on and they're looking at some pretty important things about the role of, of government and many rules on that. I'm not totally familiar with the process, but I think it's worthwhile for the public to know that this is happening and I, and I thought I'd just endorse that. Um, I can give you examples specifically how it relates to like voting, for example, things that they may have already talked about or will talk about uh, and make and make recommendations are on include lowering the municipal voting age to 13. I'm taking this from the Six, document. 16. 16. 16. Sorry, 13 would be probably not good. Um, <laughs> adopting ranked choice voting for municipal uh, elections. Um, Removing the need to cite a specific reason to receive an absentee ballot for municipal elections. Um, removing the designation candidate for re-election from the names of incumbents on municipal ballots. And certainly, you know, that we run every, we run on a two-year cycle. I don't know, you know, if they would take that up, but if, it, it, whether you want to extend that or reduce that, but I just felt like I just wanted everybody to know that these are important things they're talking about and they're going to make recommendations by the end of December to the next level of this and there's a website they have a document that they're updating that talks about how they're updating the, the charter so that's interesting and each uh, ward has a member on the charter that um, represents each of their ward members so there's a list on their website if you're interested in contacting them I don't know the process to getting your voice there or 
discussed, but it's a li it's more informal than us. They don't have they, you know they have people talking. It's not restricted to three minutes. It seems more engaging, and I think it's a good opportunity if you have something to discuss. That would be a that would be a good forum to do so. Um, the other thing I want can I go on here? Sure can. All right, so the other thing I want to mention is that. Um, each year in Northampton, we have new employees. I think uh, we have approximately 40 new employees uh, coming into the school district next year. And I asked Dr. Provost, who then led me to uh, Dr. Cheevers and Annuals, uh, Andrew Samuelson, who are running the orientation for new employees. On it's a two-day orientation, and I asked if I could or we could come just to say welcome. We're school committee members. This is what we do, and um, these, you know, we're your representatives. So I don't exactly know what I'm going to say, but I, it was accepted. The idea, I'm more than welcome. So I plan on the August 20th at 10:15 at the high school library to spend no more than five minutes <laughs> welcoming our new employees. And I just wanted to offer this invite to you guys as well, if anybody wants to join me. Um, and if you can't join, but you want me to say something on behalf of the school committee, that would be, um, just let me know, drop me a line. It's gonna be um, uh, very quick, but I, I think I just wanna share information about the school committee's roles and responsibilities and welcome. Thank you very much, You're Mr. Welcome. Kaufman. Any other announcements? Okay, hearing none, um, we now uh, move on to uh, recommended actions of the school committee. Um, this is, uh, typically our consent agenda, and we have one item on the agenda this evening, um, which is the school committee minutes of July 8, 2019. Um, and don't know, I uh, believe everyone has received that electronically and then received a copy tonight. Um, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve those so minutes. Moved. Okay, is there a second? Okay, any discussion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that's approved. Next, under uh, reports and recommendations, we have a uh, requested vote on an approval of the Clark School lease extension. I'll turn to the superintendent. So there is one final year remaining of potential lease extension for the Clark School at Leeds. I met with representatives from the Clark School and um, explain to them that we are um, starting to have some concerns about space at Leeds. Um, but we do think that we could um, accommodate them for the final year of their potential um, extension on their lease. Uh, as is consistent with our practice in the past, I told them it would be at a 2.75% inflation factor, um, which they agreed to. And so I'm recommending tonight that you authorize the extension, or the final one-year extension of the Leeds, um, or the Clark School uh, lease at Leeds. Um, and just, I would say for the public, that, that may, there may be some modifications necessary next year. The footprint um, of Clark School may not be able to remain as large as it currently is if we get the students that we're anticipating enrolling um, at Leeds. Um, but it would be time to shortly after taking this vote, start thinking about what that might look like. Um, we will have um, an opportunity for the new principal to assess the situation and, and um, sort of get the lay of the land. So I would also rely on her recommendations and starting to think about what the future of Clark School at Leeds is. Excellent. Um, I would um, approve the school Leeds extension. Okay, so there's a motion. Is there a second? second. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Uh, Ms. Voss. So, um, Dr. Provost, I just would like a little more information. Um, so at some point earlier this year, we talked about this, and we also talked about the preschool that's currently at Leeds moving to the high school, and my understanding is some things have changed, and I think it would be helpful just to hear where we're at to clarify what has changed since the last time this committee talked about it, please. Sure. Uh, the main thing is that as we um, began the assessment of the budget, when we were asked to redo the budget and re-look re at all of the items on there, realized that um, Mr. Kanata had made a miscount um, of his space. Basically the problem was that he was anticipating creating an additional teacher um, lounge or workspace that had not been approved and so he took over a classroom in order to do that. Um, without 
taking that space out of out of the mix, there are enough classrooms at Leeds. Um, the other thing that changed is that we have a new principal at Leeds and a new principal at the high school, and we've had um, the issue of contract negotiations that's really prevented um, me from being able to support those two two new administrators and trying to think about a transition from one school to the next. I still think that moving one of the um, classrooms to the high school makes a lot of sense, um, but it, it, we weren't able to prepare for it adequately this summer and we didn't need to prepare for it because, um, as it turns out, there are enough classrooms at Leeds for this current year. Can I just clarify? Sure. So, um, this room that was maybe was going to become a teacher's lounge is now going to become a classroom so are there actually more classrooms needed at Leeds this year or are we approving something that means the footprint of the Clark School and the preschool at Leeds and the number of kindergartens is exactly the same from last year we're just gonna repeat what we had last year at Leeds this year is that what we're approving there's one grade that has two classes at Leeds and the rest of them have three that grade is bubbling up so I, I've not sure whether that's fourth grade or fifth grade this current year. So it's the same number of classrooms that you had last year. Mr. Kanata's plan would have taken one of the classrooms and made it into a teacher workspace. Um, by saying no to that, we maintain the number of classrooms that we had <laughs> last year. So it's the same number of staff, the same number of classrooms, um, roughly the same number of students. Ms. Pusansky? I have okay. some more questions. Okay. Did that answer you? I, I have one more, but Ms. Burnham can oh, go Ms. first. Burnham. Um, are there other schools that you're considering that Clark could move to that we have more space that they would want to? Or why is Leeds the perfect space for them? Well, I, I think because Clark School has made an extensive investment in um, upgrades to the space. If you look at the classrooms that they're currently occupying, every single one of them has been um, has been transformed into a space that has a classroom, an observation room, and um, sort of like a, a separate alcove. So recreating that in another building would be quite a cost for them. Um, it is also a consideration for what we would do if we need to reclaim it. There would be quite a bit of demolition cost involved in restoring that to a traditional classroom space. Just for the public's clarification, how long, uh, where are we in this lease? I know that this is a renewed lease. Just so that we, you know, this is not something they didn't just move in last right. year. I believe I believe it's an original three-year lease with three one-year extensions, and this is the last one-year extension. Okay, so we're going on year six, basically, at this arrangement. Okay. Um, um, I, I was hoping to also understand, you made a comment that moving forward, we might need to change some footprint space, and my understanding is you're talking about not this September but next September if both the preschool and the Clark School were to stay there um, and I would like to hear more about that and also potentially if the Clark School is going to make us spend money to reconfigure it why wouldn't they pay for that well they're renters um, so they there is money in a reserve account um, part of the part of the um, rationale for that is that if there came a time when the, the lease had to end and space needed to be converted back to traditional classroom space that that rental money could be used for the um, demolition and restoration of classes to traditional spaces. Um, there are a number of spaces that um, Leeds is occupying and that, that Clark is occupying at Leeds so we haven't had any detailed discussions about what might change if we're doing a, a different type of rental agreement moving forward. Um, some of those might not involve demolition costs. Um, we really have to take a close look at what our projected enrollment is going to be and figure out um, exactly where all the preschools are going to be before we start moving forward with that because it will be disruptive to our, um, both to Leeds itself and to Clark. Yes, Ms. Um, in the course of this conversation, we're also, you know, I don't want us to <coughs> limit this by thinking um, only of space. There is a value that the Clark School is bringing to our communities and something that I, and, you know, I think everybody in this committee and in our public schools believes in, which is the integration of all of these students. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, I mean, Leeds is also really privileged to 
have the opportunity to have Clark School there and to be integrating their students and to be a part of something that's so important um, that I just also just sort of want to name that and maybe including that, I mean maybe sharing something about that would also help to you know, remind us why these programs are there. So I can speak to that from my uh, history as a special education director. I remember when um, the Clark program, I had many students placed in the Clark programs and they were all off campus. Um, it was a beautiful campus, but it was not a public school. Um, and there, I always felt that what we were doing for the kids was definitely in their best interest and the best thing we could come up with, but also in a sense somewhat artificial and not really inclusive because um, they were getting an educational experience that was taking them out of their neighborhood, taking them away from peers, taking them away from the traditional um, experience of childhood that um, public education provides. So I think that having the Clark School at Leeds does provide a benefit for those students, whatever district they come from, including the ones that come from Northampton. Um, and certainly they're the benefits for typical peers um, to have more of an opportunity to integrate, in, um, integrate and engage with students. Um, most of the students in Clark um, are cochlear implanted um, students, and so just to um, have that experience of diversity I think is very helpful for our kids. So, um, so I sure. So, so I agree, I work with hearing, so I'm very well aware of all this and it's wonderful to have the Clark School and welcome them and it's great that their students can participate with ours. Um, I think we also just have to look out for leads because they have more students coming and they have a preschool and they have the Clark School and um, I think what I'd just like to offer is over the course of the next few months I, I clearly feel like August you, you can't make changes like this. Um, that would be impractical but this committee would like I, I as a member of this committee would like to hear back about what the plan is for next year more like in the winter months and think about where the preschool should be and really plan ahead so that we make sure all of our kindergartens at all of our schools have the space they need and we think about where the preschools belong and a lot of this is because there's been many changes over the last few years but I just would encourage us to do that soon and to hear from the stakeholders who know how this works to make the best decision possible. Thank you. Um, so back to the main motion, which is just granting the one-year lease extension um, to Clark School, again, which is already embedded in the lease that's already been approved. Um, so the vote, uh, the motion on the table is to approve that one-year, final one-year lease extension. Um, and without any further discussion, I would ask all those in favor to please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, excellent, so that is approved. Um, next, we have a vote uh, on our uh, district's participation in the National School Lunch Program. Um, Ms. Lamica, did you want to uh, just explain that? Sure. Um, so it's my understanding here in Northampton um, that each year the school committee votes to participate in the National School um, Lunch Program, mm -hmm. um, which includes breakfast and lunch uh, programs, um, but usually votes on that they're going to participate, which allows us to accept the federal funding and go along with the guidelines that are required as far okay. as yes it is something we do every every year to be sure um, I would I would entertain a motion on that motion to uh, participate in the national school lunch program second okay so there's been a motion made and second is there any discussion about that hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed any abstentions Okay, so that is approved. Um, we've already taken up item C, so now we move to uh, D, which is a report to the school committee on uh, Chromebook uh, usage, breakage, and replacement. Um, and I believe Ms. McLaughlin is here. Is she not here? I don't see her. Okay. I can take it. Okay. Um, she did provide information to us, though, a one-page uh, information sheet. Um, which I believe you have, which provides the statistics that were requested. Um, this was a, a request from Ms. Busansky who wanted just to get an update on where we were on this issue of um, uh, you know, units that needed repair, breakage, insured, et cetera. So, um, yes. Can I just add to that why I requested it sure. on the agenda, which is we are rolling out the high school Chromebook program, I believe, if I'm 
Is that accurate? And so I think it's important that we take a look and learn from this first year and figure out what we can do better next year and what we, um, you know, what has gone well and what hasn't. So that's why I really want to. Understood. Thank you. Um, so this is, uh, this is, turn it over to you sure. to make that presentation. So, um, this set of tables really shows the performance of the machines and our um, machine protection program. As you recall, in, as we rolled out the, the program at JFK, students and their families were uh, offered the option of buying into a um, optional protection plan um, on a sliding scale based on family wealth. So, 622 units were distributed and 465 families purchased protection plans. The green table at the top shows you the repairs that were necessary over the course of the year. Um, there are three types of repairs listed. One is NPS IT hardware. Um, these are mainly simple repairs where a, a key might fall off or um, some some other component of the of the Chromebook that could easily be um, replaced from some of the machines that w have already been taken out of service. So there were approximately 26, or not, there were exactly 26 of those. There's zero cost associated with that because that was not a matter of ordering parts, it was recycling parts, and it was using our existing labor. Um, I believe some of the students in our IT innovation pathway also assisted with some of those repairs. Then there were the next line, which is the Tech Defender, this is the, are the repairs that were made through our protection program. Um, there were 73 of those. The cost associated with that is $6,570. Um, the way the Tech Defender program works is it's $99 per repair, whatever the repair is. Um, and so those were one sent out. There also were some machines that we were purchased that were just defective, um, and so they were replaced on warranty. There were nine of those. Um, so there were 108 repairs over the course of the year for a cost of $6,570. Um, there's more detail on what the repairs that done by Tech Defender in the purple table. You can see that among those, uh, the main, the main um, type of breakage had to do with screens. 64 of those were screens that needed to be replaced. Then we had two f headphone jacks, two power ports, three keyboards, and again, the nine that were replaced under warranty. Um, so um, through our insurance program, we and the 465 participating families we received $7,876. The cost of the repairs altogether was 6570 So we ended up with a little bit of um, leftover profit, if you will, from our protection program. It, to me, says that our tech department was right on in terms of the anticipation that they, uh, the, the breakage that they anticipated and the price point that they set to cover that. Um, one of the things we know um, also from the research they did on, on that is that the breakage is likely to be highest in the first year. So some of the repairs uh, may be coming down. We may be seeing some larger balances in future years, but um, we were able to cover the costs through the protection plan. So that essentially um, is all of the repairs that were done through the JFK Chromebook project and what the net cost was. Um, related to this, I know that the robocall went out to middle school families about the Chromebooks. Was that related? Is that seeking to get more information on this? I don't know. Oh, was I'm the sorry, robocall? Can I just say there was a robocall? I meant to say something in the announcements and I forgot, which is that any um, JFK students, there's a survey. So any families that were at JFK during this year, there's a survey on our website um, asking how that went for them. And there was a robocall that went out. Oh, okay. Yes, Ms. Pisansky. Do you know anything about the survey, Dr. Provost? Yes, I, um, I didn't know that there was a robocall about the survey, but I did know yeah, that. I said too, but anyway. I, I did know that um, the, the IT department is collecting experiences of students and their families and also teachers with the first year of the program um, so that 
they can use that to inform their future decisions about the program. And do you know, there's a question on the survey about uh, asking if you have um, computer and internet access at home. Do you know why that question is being asked? Because that's a very important uh, matter of digital equity. Um, as you know, we have a lending um, program. Actually, that before we had the ability to provide devices for all students, we had a lending program at both the middle school and high school because there are, are a number of assignments that are impossible to do if you don't have um, internet connectivity in the device. Um, so we have mobile hotspots that we rent, or not rent, that we loan out to families, and we have um, devices that we had been loaning out before we had the one-to-one -one program. Um, the reason for uh, the reason to ask that question is because the connectivity at the home still is an important issue. If you provide a student with a device, but they need to be online in order to, in order to do their homework, having the device doesn't really help unless they also have connectivity. And so we're able to assist families who don't have internet access at home by loaning out mobile hotspots to them. I thought the question actually really, I'd have to go back and look again, but actually just spoke to whether you have computer and internet access. It didn't really um, parse out those two, but I'd have to look at the survey again. So I don't know if that would really get at what you're, I understand the importance of that, what you're explaining, but anyway, I don't think I have time right now to look that up. Okay. Okay. I'm looking at it. Do you want to know where it is? Yeah, what's the so question? The question I think we're re referencing is, does your student have access to a computer at home the student can work on to complete schoolwork? Right, so that has nothing to do with internet access. It might be another one. I, I was just... Okay. Want, uh, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> is there another one, Jen? I don't know. I don't think there is. I, I just thought maybe there was a thought of keeping the Chromebooks at school and not sending them home with kids who don't need to go home with them to maybe help reduce possibly some breakages, but it's hard to tell from this report. Well, that has been part of the discussion um, this year. I don't think there have been any decisions made on that, um, but I do know that there are some students and families who've wondered about leaving the, the devices at school and charging them at school. Um, so I know at the middle school, there, there are discussions of that. don't know that they've necessarily made a determination at this point. So again, I, I just to inform exactly what you're saying, John, that the survey says your child will have the option to leave the Chromebook at school in grades 7 and 8 and not take it home. Um, given the choice to leave the Chromebook at school next year, are you planning to having your child do so? So it sounds like a decision has been made and um, they're going to get some information on what degree of uh, interest there is in doing that. So. There, just to clarify, there's always been the option to leave the Chromebook at home for the day, for the eighth graders last year. That was an option. And so it would be different to say you don't bring it home unless and seventh you need it. Too. Seventh graders too. Got it. Ms. Foss. Um, I again would like to just put out, I think it would be helpful, as Ms. Busiansky said, to hear a maybe broader description of how this worked and what the hiccups were and how we're using what we've learned to make a better rollout at the high school and it's already August and I think we need to be more thoughtful about talking about it sooner so that we can learn from what's going on and I, I looking at this chart that we were sent which has some information in it but certainly um, I, I was hoping to see results from this survey you're talking about but the information here, I'm troubled by the fact that we're asking a lot of families, I think, to spend $25 is that, to ensure a Chromebook that costs $230. So this is on the order of 10% of the cost of the Chromebook. And you know we don't insure our houses for $20,000 if that's 10%. And I just think that's a lot of money to ask people to pay to insure a Chromebook. Um, and the week that the bills came out, I had three people just catch me wherever I was and say, I just got billed $109 for the screen for my kid's Chromebook. And I think that's a lot. Um, and a repair percentage of 17.4% on these Chromebooks that this committee has been told are going to last for seven years. Um, in the first year, I, I would disagree. I would think a Chromebook would have its best chance of not breaking in the first year, more like a car. If, as it gets older, it might break more frequently as it gets older. So I think these are things that I don't want to see this committee not be 
engaged in for a whole year. We have a lot invested in this and we need to have some feedback in terms of how it affects our budget. Um, and I will just add the student union shared data with this committee. People can correct me if I'm remembering it wrong. But at the high school, I believe 92% of the students did have connectivity at home. It was something like 8% that would need to borrow from the library. And it's a good number to know. And I just want to clarify that, you know, Ms. Busansky made a very specific request for tonight's meeting that had, you know, very specific information. So I, right. that's what we were responding to. So I... It, well, I also said usage, and we don't seem to have that in this report at all. And it's, okay. it, um, though it did make it onto our agenda. So I think it'd be, I, I had thought we were also going to discuss how the Chromebooks were used during the classroom, at home at night, on the weekends, and and learn about all the, because we've collected all that information. So that w I thought was going to be part of tonight's discussion. And I just figured this one PDF was just part of a larger discussion we're going to have. But okay. without Ms. McLaughlin here, it's a little hard to have that discussion. So maybe we could have that at our next meeting. At a future meeting. OK. Yeah, in September. I, I will just point out that some of the information on usage will be difficult um, to provide because in our um, zeal to protect student privacy, one of the things we did was make a special arrangement with GoGuardian to delete all of our data at the end of the year. So the information they were collecting for last year has now been permanently destroyed. Um, so we may not be able to have that kind of usage data. Ms. Voss. I think it's, it's relevant to the more general discussion to say that the screen time committee that was um, agreed upon last September did finally meet a couple weeks ago and um, I, I was part of it and um, learned a lot and I thought it was really helpful and I hope we meet again soon because one of the goals is to provide some guidelines for introducing technology into classrooms. Um, some of the things that came out I think should be shared with this committee more in general in terms of how do we roll this out at the high school now because it's a very complicated um, issue. My understanding is these Chromebooks that are going home have different restrictions on them for weekdays and for weeknights and it's really been left up to the parents to monitor them and while that I don't know whose decision that is in the end it, I think it should be more of a public conversation about how they're being used and what the effects of them are and the other thing that came out is there the, the idea that it would be interesting to have, a, or, or important to have a guideline about um, what is appropriate use of the Chromebooks during the school day. If children finish their assignment early, are they allowed to just go browse and um, do non-academic kinds of things on the Chromebooks, which appears to be something we don't really have guidelines for at this point. And, and I'd, like, I'd like to see that addressed before we have our entire district having 24-7 access to Chromebooks. Mr. Kaufman? Yeah, thank you. So um, I, in the spirit of, I think, what Ms. Bozanski was bringing up, which is that is, if you look at usage as the big picture, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I, I, I like this survey. It's got some decent questions. That, but it really only has one question to ask the parents for feedback on how things went. A lot of it out is whether they were effectively communicated with and whether they knew it was checked out. And I think that's useful in terms of the next stage of the rollout. But, Given the magnitude of the money we put in, the effect it has on curriculum instruction, some of the concerns that parents and others have raised around screen time and, and whatever, yeah, I would love to get a more comprehensive sort of feedback report if that exists. And if it doesn't exist, uh, I would love for you to uh, encourage that, John. I, just, I think, um, and again, I, I can help you design some questions or some protocols to do so because I do a lot of that. But um, let's take advantage of what we learned and let's take advantage of some of the sensitivities. Let's make sure we're doing this the right way and certainly moving into high school. You know, if their parents are concerned about they can't watch what their kids are doing, they, they wish there was better software, then let's get better software. I mean, that's just one example. But I think how it, from teachers, how it impacted their curriculum instruction, whether it enhanced it, whether they need more training, these are all just fundamentally um, important questions. And I think it feeds into our responsibility of ensuring uh, our high quality education continues. So thank you for bringing it up and Mike, you, you understand what I'm asking. I mean, if we can get more, more information, the sooner the better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Busansky. Well, and I just want to add, I have heard from parents, not only about them being charged for, you know, Chromebook repairs, some parents who had insurance, some parents who didn't, but I've also heard that 
kids are, um, if they finish their work early, getting back to what Dr. Voss was mentioning, um, that they're able to uh, use their computer and they have their Chromebook and there are video games we've already heard from that we can't seem to you know clean them all off and because they come back on or they're able to watch YouTube videos and so whereas the before maybe they would be finishing homework or they would be reading or they'd be able to talk quietly with a kid now they're on their Chromebook so I think you know now they're on the screen so I think it's just important stuff I know one mother complained to me a few months ago because her child was watching Netflix on the Chromebook. So these are educational devices that we wanted to, you know, give to our students to enhance their educational experience. And I think we just need to be really clear about when the, what, what are the limits and how, how is that rolling out and how is that working. And one of my, another concern at the high school is that we finally have done something to control smartphone use by our students during class time, and now we're going to hand them a Chromebook where they can do everything on that Chromebook that they can't do on their smartphone because it's in a caddy at the front of the room. So it feels like we're sort of almost going back in time <laughs> instead of moving forward. Okay. So I'd like to know more about that because this Was is obviously just what I've heard from some parents yeah, and some students. That'd be good. It would also be good to hear what we're allowing in our network. You know, yeah. I, I'm. I'd be shocked if you could access Netflix from within our network. Cause no, I, you can do that at home. That's what right? I'm saying. You have an I just wanted, I wanted yes. to clarify okay, that yeah. someone wasn't watching Netflix at well, school. Well, YouTube. You can do YouTube at, at home. school. Exactly, yeah. And that okay. one's a little more yeah. challenging to delineate. But I just oh, okay. make that clear. Netflix at home. Because basically you can't YouTube access Netflix school. from within the city network. So, okay. Gotcha. So, um, just to add to this list of things that I think the school committee would potentially be very interested to hear about in terms of data is I understand we might not be able to know where the students have browsed because GoGuardian has cleaned that off and that's fantastic. But where, what I am almost sure is available if we have somebody who can find it is not through GoGuardian but through the Google administrative system how much time each individual username has been logged in through our school system and I personally would be interested in just histograms, charts over entire grades. I'm not looking for one teacher, I'm not looking for one kid, but on average how much during the six to six and a half hours of a day that our kids are in the classroom, how long are they logged on to the Chromebooks? Because it's important for them to learn how to talk to each other, how to work on things together, and that's something I'd like us to look at and see if it's changing year to year, how we feel about it. I mean, clearly if they're logged on for five minutes, not everybody needs a Chromebook. If they're logged on for six hours, we're gonna be really concerned. What is that number and what kind of guidelines should be attached to it and just knowing how much time different kids of different ages are logged onto these Chromebooks is a very helpful thing when we're trying to figure out how to move forward and support them all. Mr. Meyer, you I would just say that we need to be careful in terms of designing our data collection tools because they could be logged on and discussing data with a partner. Sure. They could be logged on sure. and working on a, you know, an online lab. So you can't necessarily say because they're logged on that they're not interacting or practicing, you know, sure. academic discourse. They also forget to log out. Right. right. If it's if it's open, yeah. But if they close it, they're logged out. If it's not on. Okay. okay. So thank you again, and thank you for raising this, Ms. Busansky, and we'll um, look forward to some follow-on presentations on this. Okay. Thank okay. You. Um, next, we have a discussion on the handbook code of conduct progress. Dr. Provost. Thank you. In your materials, you have the basic draft version of the Code of Conduct. We had anticipated that we'd also have graphics in here. Um, I mean, there are graphics in here, but pictures and a much more attractive visual display to, to present at this time. We don't have that due to the work to rule, because um, we would have students providing that um, service for us under the direction of teachers. Um, but hopefully we'll get back to that soon. Uh, the other piece that has been added to this um, since it was put in your packet in anticipation of a vote coming up later tonight on one of our policies is a question and answer guide regarding monitoring of student online activity through district software, so that now is on here as well. But um, this document will next go through the process of having um, 
having the students put it into a much more presentable format and then go for legal review and then finally translation before we move it into implementation. The committee uh, who developed it included several parents who suggested that prior to moving to implementation we should uh, also have a series of public forums so that parents can um, be briefed on the new code of conduct and um, understand the differences between it and our current student handbooks so we'll also be doing that my expectation is that we'd be looking for um, implementation sometime around second semester of the upcoming year so um, this is just an update for you this is normally the meeting where we um, where we approve handbooks for the upcoming year last year we just um, I just asked the school committee to approve continuation of the current handbooks while we worked on the code of conduct. So now I would be um, not really asking for a vote, but just letting that, that um, status remain in place while we have this um, code of conduct finished up. But you can see basically what the content will be and sort of the philosophy that we're striving for in this new version. Okay. Ms. Uh, Fallon. Um, so I have a few questions. Concerns. One is who do, who should we give feedback to if there are just basic errors or things that we want to have corrected before it goes final? Well, I think if you have any grammatical uh, corrections, or yeah, or like, like that, they you keep can referring to the to school me. committee as the school board, which I think is confusing. Yeah, the board of education is the board. Yep. Yep. Um, so who to you? You can send them directly to me. Okay, and then. There's also an issue which I actually take a little bit of responsibility for as the Rules and Policy Chair where on page 13 and 14 under complaint procedures, and I realize that this comes from our policy, um, it very clearly states that none of this complaints will be disregarded. Um, but then on page 18 and 19 we um, cite the chapter 92 of the Acts of 2010 and Act rel uh, relative to bullying in schools. Um, and under that, we quote um, a number three, sorry, um, that upon receipt of a complaint, even an anonymous one. And so I'm assuming that, the, that that would take precedence over our school policy, right? It's really about two different kinds of complaints. Well, the policy, the school policy has to do with complaints about curriculum personnel. I forget what the other piece was in the old um, policy. The bullying section has to do with bullying and harassment complaints. Bullying and harassment complaints under the Massachusetts law um, must allow for anonymous reporting. Right, but so what I'm saying, like, I, I don't think you have this and we have this in the same document about complaints, and I, and I get that we've, you know, that it's very clear this one is rel related to bullying, but I think it is confusing because in the other, yes, it's complaints about personnel, but what if it's complaints about a personnel bullying, harassing, being discriminatory? And so I do wonder if it should be aligned. Well, I think in that case, I mean, there may be something we can do with the language around this, but I think in that case, it would be clear to the receiver of the complaint with it possible exception of the school committee if the school committee was the receiver of the complaint that the bullying statute has to take precedent okay. you know and and the fact that it's an anonymous complaint wouldn't prevent an administrator from following up on it okay and then can I raise the other sure Wait, the, go back to that one. Okay. Yeah, Ms. Hennessy just okay. has to my concern though I get that Laura would be that it would prevent, I, I just want the language to be clear because it could prevent someone from actually offering a complaint because they feel like it's anonymous. Right. So that's where I would want it, like the readers I think would take the anonymous complaint about bullying, but if someone's reading this and says, oh, I can't do an anonymous complaint, that would be my concern. So it would be right. really clear, complaint about curriculum or whatever versus bullying. Right. And, um, that's it. and then I'm going to ask, I, I realize that you very much simplified the dress code policy, mm -hmm. um, but I am going to ask that we look at the portion around headwear again. Um, I realize it's a national conversation. Um, I did attend um, 
the Summer Institute for the Massachusetts Association of School Committees this um, summer, and there was a session on equity and understanding the dynamics of power and privilege and prejudice. And I, this, well, the speaker was from the Cambridge Public Schools, from the middle school, a principal, and this has already come up there. And I think it was really important that they do allow anyone to wear um, to wear hats, headwear. It's not a, it's not forbidden in any way. And so I started looking at it, and I know that, for instance, like the or in Oregon, it's been a big topic of discussion, and the National Organization for Women came out with a model student dress code guidance, and what really jumped out was that, you know, they said that student dress codes and administrative enforcement shouldn't reinforce or increase marginalization or oppression of any group based on race, gender, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, household income, gender identity, or cultural observance. And so I think that it is important to think about um, our students who are gender non-binary binary or students um, who for whatever reason um, would feel marginalized by a policy that forbids them. I know that at the high school it's permitted, but at the middle school and the elementary school it's not. Um, and I know that in other districts the question of hooded sweatshirts comes up. So I think we can be more thoughtful about it. I think that when we keep talking about equity and bias and anti-racism that these are the types of policy decisions. I mean, this is our, this is gonna be like the big document governing our district and I think that we need to be more thoughtful about those types of, those types of questions. So that's, I, I realize all the work's already got into it, but that was something that I felt was really important. I think that's good feedback. You know, obviously this is far from a final version. Um, the the committee who uh, got the the document to this state, I think, should be the the group that hears that feedback and works with it. So, um, this was something that Miss Choquette was chairing. If she's still with us, I'll ask her to do that. Otherwise, I will probably take it on myself. Thank you, Miss Foss. Um, thank you, and I'm, I'm just going to add to that. Um, I think this goal of having a code of conduct for the entire district is a really good one, but I worry that we have um, a lot more work to do, and we've underestimated what that's going to take from what currently exists. And I just want us to, for me, to acknowledge that right now this document is really long and really impenetrable. It was, it's. It, it repeats itself, it, in the be, you know, as an example, in the beginning it defines caregivers, at the end it defines parents. And there's just, it's kind of along the lines of some of the things you're saying. And it's not at a point where I feel like we can send a couple typos in. I feel like it's really hard to read. There's several places where the headings don't actually match what's being discussed under them. And it's nowhere near ready to hand over to students to help make it easier to read. Um, it's meant for kindergarten age through high school, and right now there's no place in here that I think even a parent of any of those um, ages would find something easily that addresses what their child's needs are. So I, I think it needs a pretty major overhaul before um, moving forward. Ms. Musansky. Um, I mean, I also found it, um, yeah, it's just, it's so huge. It kind of, to me, it cried out to, for some really good graphic design and some maybe simple, you know, one-pagers at the front so people can just find the information fast. I, I don't know that we should be, like, scripting what a child should say if they're in a situation of bullying because I don't know how any parent would ever find that to go over with their child. I mean, it's just so huge. And I understand it's a big topic. I'm not trying to you know, minimize that, but I was really struck by that. Um, I have some um, content um, issues, but I could always just, it might just be easier if I just email them and you take them to the committee and the committee um, discusses them, but, I, but I'm hoping we will see this again, it will come back to us again. Mm -hmm. I kind of appreciate seeing it in an earlier form so we could have some feedback, and, but I'd like to see it in a later form. And it will be coming back to us, yes? Well, just to clarify the process, it will then be ratified by the school councils and then come to the school committee to make sure that what's been ratified doesn't violate any school committee policies. Got it. Well, I would just really um, then, I guess, just urge uh, 
the committee to make it a really try to make it as user friendly of a document as possible because it's just right the way it stands now it just you know isn't so anything that could be done to make it a user friendly document. Okay, Miss Bob. Is it was this document that we were asked to read written by a committee or was it put together by who wrote it? So if you go to page, I saw the list of people, but did they all write it or did yes. they just contribute? Because when you look at it, it does look like different people wrote different sections and they're just not consistent with each other. And you have some places where you have a paragraph and you have some places where you have incomplete sentences and bullets. And it's a really big project and it's an important project, but we haven't put the right resources into making it something that's usable by the people that need to use it is where I'm at with it. So again, I didn't represent this as something that was ready to no, go out to parents. Yeah. I said this is the, yeah. the update on where we are at this point in time. But um, the, the group that's listed on pages three and four of the document are the ones who've been working on it over the course of the past year. And there may be some differences in tone and voice from section to section because the basic um, method of methodology of the group was to take different sections and assign them to different pairs of, uh, of individuals who worked on them and then to come together periodically as a committee to review what each of the subgroups had done and um, either give it the thumbs up or thumbs down for inclusion in the final document. Yes, Mr. Coffman. So, uh, so about a year ago, John, you talked about doing this and uh, you shared with us the Syracuse model and I just want to say this is um, is tremendous progress. I agree with what everybody said. It's kind of sloppy. It's hard to find. And I would imagine so many people involved, they tried to be inclusive about everything and maybe they didn't look at the application of it. So that could be fixed. But I just want to say that this is such a fundamental importance on how we educate our kids and what they, what we teach them and how they work out their way through our schools that, you know, I'm just so pleased to see the progress that's been made. But I'm as confused as anybody about some of the sections, so I'm glad that there'll be more opportunity for next steps. And uh, just a couple of suggestions. Um, I, I do look at this list, and it's lengthy, and it's fantastic, the, vari the variation of people. But I don't see that many parents or students involved. And obviously, this impacts them tremendously. And I, I assume the committee tried to do some recruitment. But they, they, I think they need to go out of the way to make sure that other parties see it at this point, not to set them back. but. Other parties, PTOs, uh, student councils, kids will be back in, in, at the high school soon and the middle school probably to core groups that could influence if they understand it, if they embrace it, if they have questions. So I also kind of support the idea of spending more time because this is so important. And again, I, I, I compliment the team. I, I love the progress and I love the, the movement towards this. I've always said this and it's about time that we did something and I'm really proud of the fact that Northampton has taken the lead as a, as a city and as a part of the state to move forward in such a progressive manner. Thank you. Ms. Byrne. I was going to say the same thing, and I just really want to echo. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness that our school committee comes to to look at these things. Um, but as a, as a whole document and the work that people went into, I think it's a testament of where we want to be. And things like you know sharing with the public, and I think when you do sort of just like the guiding principles that teaching social and emotional skills is as important as teaching academic comment and how we teach is as important as what we teach. I mean that those are the two top guiding principles is um, it's just everything else can be fixed. I'm a writer. Like that's what that is what happens. It is a process and as you said this is just this is initial stage but to approach the process from such an important place as Mr. Kaufman was pointing out I think really um, is a testament to what our values are and that's what we're that's just so important, especially compared to other codes of conduct. And I really uh, applaud the team of people uh, on top of everything else that everybody's trying to do, the amount of work that it would take to, to do this um, is really, I really thank them very much. Mr. Moore? Yeah, and I just want to, I, I don't know exactly what this comment is. It's the, the length of, these, of this document is just like, I'm looking here at the JFK's Student handbook from about five years ago, which has 47 pages, um, not including the cover. Um, so it's a similar length thing, and you know it may be an issue of some of the stuff that people feel needs to be in there. You know, just takes up space. You know, if you put in, if you put in the state law on bullying, that's several pages. If you put in, you know, and you and you feel like if you, so it's an editorial question to some extent. 
not 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 always just a design and sort of style question of user friendliness. It's sort of questions about if you need to put it in, well, it takes up that much space, and a lot of it is stuff like the state law and bullying. I think needs to be in. It's probably required in the state law that it be in the handbook, and yet it is not a user friendly item, and there's no way to make it be. Um, but it has to be there, and and so on. There's a lot of things like that that they themselves can't be. So I, I in that the only way that. I mean, the, the attempt then is to put things into appendices and do that sort of stuff. That's why people do that. Um, but in the end, you, it seems like you might end up with a thing about as long and about as impenetrable in terms of if you were going to sit down and read it, you couldn't because it's got these appendices and items. So I don't know. It, it may be a, there may be a tension there that's just not going to be solved. Ms. Fallon? Um, I actually agree with what um, Mr. Moore and Ms. Usansky said in that. I think it is dense, and I think that it is important, like when we have this section on discipline of students with disabilities, that they do include all the Mass General Law, and they do include the Individuals with Disability Education Act. I think it's important to have it as a resource, but I also think that it could mm -hmm. be put in a second portion as a resource, like in an mm -hmm. appendix, um, to make the initial portion readable, bright bullet points, the part that really is... And then a clearly good says like, and, and if you and need to know more, goals. look at Right. And then I would <laughs> reference people That's to all Graphic design. design. Right. That is, yeah. that is, so that I, is. That is. What I meant is you're still going to get 50 like, pages. The length, is gonna, I think yeah. the length is going to be stuck at 46 pages, but yeah. probably more once you add big graphics. But I do think that it could be more readable. Mm -hmm. But I do appreciate all the hard work, and I think it's a significant improvement over the direction we were in the mm -hmm. past. Any other uh, questions or comments about this, Mr. Kaufman? Thank you, Dr. So, Barbara. Just for clarity, did you say that this so this will end up in the uh, student handbooks, the respective student handbooks? This will replace the student handbooks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we will vote on the student handbooks in the time in the in the. This will be part. Okay, we'll vote on those at a at a later date, and this will be in a You're different. Right. Vote on the final version of this after it's been approved by the school councils at a later date. And so instead of them each approving their own, they'll all be approving, they'll be taking separate right. votes on a universal document. Right. But when you say it will replace the handbooks, I don't have it in front of me. Don't the student handbooks include a lot of other information for students? Cell they, time, schedule times? They, know, I mean, all these other things that are not part of the code of conduct? They do, but I mean, the vast majority of those books has to do with student discipline. And so right now we have three different discipline um, codes, if you will, one for elementary, one for middle, and one for high. The the idea was to get a single document that um, yeah. carries kids from pre-K to 12. There will certainly have to be other types of publications that are specific to schools, but the goal is to have this be the, the publication that covers the discipline for all students in the district. Okay. Any other, uh, any other discussions on this? Okay, so thank you for that update, uh, Superintendent. Um, next, we have a requested vote. Uh, this is regarding the superintendent and uh, carrying over nine vacation days. Uh, did you want to uh, explain that, Dr. Provost? I started the year with 10 days that I had carried over from the prior year. I was able to take all of my vacation days and one from that. Um, that surplus that I started with, and so I would ask if I can carry over nine days into the new year. Which is allowable under your contract. Yes. Yes. Is there a motion on that? Yep. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is a discussion and vote on the renewal of our legal uh, services contract. Uh, that would be with Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn, and I'll turn that over to uh, Ms. Lamica just to give us uh, background on that. Um, so currently our contract um, that we had in place ran out June 30th, so we've been running month to month at this point. Um, so I've asked um, Sullivan, Hayes to actually provide us an agreement with the rates for the next three years, including this year. Um, and that's what I had sent earlier to the committee tonight. Um, 
with the rates being for the next three years, it would be 245 for this current year, 255 for fiscal 21, and fiscal 22 would be 265. Um, so it would be a 2.5% increase for this year, and then a 4% increase for the next two years would be 4.1 and 3.9. Um, if the committee wanted to do that, we would put together a formal document the same agreement that we've had in the past in the city contract if the committee wanted to do that. Um, I just want to make sure before we proceeded with them, now that they've given their proposal for the rates, um, it does not require to go out to bid because legal services are not required um, to go out to bid. So, so um, in order to initiate this, we would need a, a motion to put it on the table if there was a motion to renew our contract with them. Um, would someone make a motion for purposes of discussion? Second. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. So again, this is our uh, our three-year legal contract has expired. We need to initiate a new one. Ms. Fallon. Is it typical for rates to increase at that? At that rate? At that rate, yeah, that's not a redundant, but it seems, it yeah, seems I, like a lot. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, the rate from last year to this year going up 2.5%, I think, is pretty customary for 2.5%, the 4%, whether you want to to direct me to go back and talk to them, I can. Well, do we have any idea what the rate is? The historicals. Um, I could go back. I know right now we're paying two thirty nine, last last fiscal year. So. So it's, we would go from two thirty nine an hour to two forty five an hour. Correct. So six dollars this year, and then it would go up ten dollars the next year, and then ten dollars. Another ten dollars. Yeah. Year. Okay. Just to understand that. Okay. I'm sorry, Ms. So I guess maybe I'm just trying to follow up on Ms. Fallon's question. So do historically speaking, though, how much has it increased year by year in past con? What was our contract three years ago? I guess I have no memory. What was the? I'm trying to remember if I have last year's contract with me. I, I grabbed fiscal 19's contract, but I don't know if I. That have would. Rates. That's what I think would be interesting to know. Is this the same rate it's gone up in the past, or is this different, higher? took last year's rate. I didn't know if I, I don't think I pulled the document that had the prior two years rates on it as well. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the one thing I, I wasn't I trying bring. to stump you. No, the one thing I didn't bring with me. I'm sorry. So this is no reflection on who we've hired, but I think we look at prices, we look at how much buses cost, we look at what other things cost in the general area, and I'd be curious to know what a what the range is for legal counsel per hour from other communities nearby, and I, maybe we don't have that data, but it feels important to know that. Because a 4% increase, two back-to-back -back years, sounds like a lot to me. So I think what we probably need to do is get a little more information. We'll just have to continue yeah. going month to month and ask for, um, get that full three-year contract that we're just concluding. and. Um, and, and then try to gather some additional information about that, um, about the rates and where they fit in. Um, so again, it's a, this is part of the negotiation in terms of a contract. So yeah, we have, we'll just continue to go month to month. I'll do that and bring that back next month. Okay. Uh, is that typical for a law firm to increase their rates every year and have a oh, yeah. three with school districts? I, I feel like in the- their rates in each year, yes to increase their rates each year? The question would be? By how much? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. So um, that one we will carry over to the next meeting. Um, so we'll just move on to the next item. Uh, next we have a vote to accept a donation from the local vocal cord bowl, uh, $2,350. And uh, Ms. Lemica, did you wanna explain sure. that? Um, we received notification that the local local court bull actually raised funds at a performance that they had earlier this year. Um, they'd like to contribute $2,350 to Northampton Public Schools to be used for the music across all the grades um, in our school district. Um, and then it was from a concert that was held earlier in the year. And they had a number of sponsors and supporters for the program as well that they've listed in the document for us, um, as well as the performers. Is there a motion on that? Motion to accept the donation for local vocal cord bowl in the amount of $2,350. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion on that uh, donation? 
Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any, exempt, any uh, abstentions? Okay, so that is approved. Next, uh, there's a requested vote uh, from the superintendent um, authorizing him to negotiate a memorandum of understanding for employee overtime pay uh, related to therapy dogs. As you can see in your, from the documents in your packet, there's been some work done on this already. The um, issue came to me in the form of a, a request for overtime payment where there was a little bit of a disagreement and I think some confusion between the employee and the administrator. The, the core issue here though really is that there's um, a ruling that we had received from the person who takes care of the city's insurance at the beginning of last year saying that uh, the city could not cover therapy dogs in the schools and so any therapy dog brought in is on an individual's um, plan right now. Um, including the dog at Jackson Street. The problem arose in this school and is likely to continue arising um, in other schools and this school as well. Under that arrangement, because the person who's the named um, individual for the insurance is reluctant to have others supervise the dog, which means that when it comes time for the individual to have their duty-free prep, if kids want to access the dog, then they lose their duty-free prep. We have had conversations with the person who um, is responsible for the city's insurance plan. After a year of implementation, I think there's some different thinking on how this could work. Um, the agencies that certify dogs, as their therapy dogs, also have um, insurance programs. And I think there's some willingness now to um, discuss an arrangement whereby the city would reimburse um, or pay for insurance obtained through a therapy dog company for individuals who are trained by the company, which would allow us to have teams of trained individuals, um, similar to the situation we have at Jackson Street, so that um, there'd be multiple people available to supervise the therapy dog, which would relieve the problem of a single person having to watch the dog all day and therefore missing duty-free prep. So um, this, MOU basically just tries to correct the issue that came up in the past, which sort of accumulated over time and then came to us um, at sort of, or came to me after it um, had already reached the point where we had a request for payment for overtime and not really prior authorization for the overtime. Um, so this should put that issue to bed. But then also looking um, prospectively at the future, we'd like to try to work on the insurance situation in general so that we can prevent things like this from happening in the future. Okay. Um, Make a motion to authorize the superintendent to negotiate an MOU for employee overtime pay related to therapy dog. Second. Second, okay. Um, Ms. Voss. So I'm fine with you taking care of this one incident in terms of, I guess, a memo of understanding authorizing the overtime. But moving forward, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the plan. My understanding is we've started having dogs in the schools and there's a lot of benefits, but there's clearly some costs associated with it. And for us as a group in the future, to hear more about those benefits versus costs and what the actual plan is, because we've never talked about putting, paying for insurance on our budget. Um, I don't know how many dogs we have in our system right now or what the actual costs are and how many people it's benefiting and if there's problems that they're causing. I, I mean, I love dogs, but I just need a bigger um, understanding of this to see what makes sense for our district in terms of liability and cost. And am I wrong? Have we talked about this and maybe I wasn't here or? No, I don't think this has ever been. Okay, I didn't I mean, know if it happened I before I was on the committee or something. Yeah, I, th I think there might have been some mention or, or just notice about different dog um, programs we've had in the district. Certainly, I think there have been some discussions of Jackson at uh, Jackson Street, um, but we've never had a discussion about the financial implications of dogs in the schools for the school committee. Ms. Hennessy. I'm just, we did have a discussion with Jackson Street just because the PTO actually covered the cost, so it didn't feel like an insurance didn't come up. So it was a little bit of a discussion, but because the PTO, at yeah. least for that cost. 
Any other uh, any other questions related to the MOU? Are they big dogs, little dogs? What's that? Low dogs, red dogs. <laughs> <laughs> the dog part. Do you like my hat? <laughs> okay. All right. I, I see where this is going. So let's take a vote. Um, all those in favor of approving the uh, uh, authorizing the superintendent to negotiate the MOU, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that um, authorization is granted. Um, next, we have a vote to approve a job description for an attendance coordinator. And I'll turn this over to uh, Dr. Provost. Yes. Um, as you know, we've been in the process of moving the traveling nurse from grant funded to um, funded within the budget over the course of the past few budget cycles. The reason for that is we had been put on notice that the funder was um, going to no longer be um, able to fund a health related position for the district. Um, the funding source is interested in having another long-term grant to the district. The last grant was about a decade in length. Um, the focus at this time is school attendance. Uh, and as you know from our uh, student success meeting, student attendance is one of the very important enabling factors for student learning. And so there, we think that um, accepting the grant for an attendance coordinator is one way of trying to address some of the attendance issues that um, prevent some students from being as successful as they could be. This job description um, goes with the new grant which we have applied for and have been awarded. Um, it has been reviewed by NACE. They have um, suggested one change which I'm amenable to. It's in the area of licensure where it says licensure under the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education as um, school adjustment counselor and a, a social Massachusetts social work license um, two I both identified bullet point um, items their suggestion was either or could be both um, but I think if it if the person has at least one of those they would be appropriate for the position so um, that was their feedback on on that um, so I just wanted to share that with you but this is a person who um, would work closely with Kelly Knight, would coordinate with Kelly Knight. Um, many, of the, um, many of the cases might overlap responsibility. We've had some discussions about how to um, sort of divide the caseload. We're not 100% um, finalized on how we want to do that, but obviously the two positions are similar and we'll need to work closely together. Um, so this is just a way of helping us in increase our um, monitoring and increase our intervention for students who are starting to show problems with attendance. Hopefully the focus will be on um, early intervention because it's very hard to change attendance patterns when kids get old. Um, but that's our vision for this. Okay. Ms. Fallon. Um, I noticed that there's travel required for visits driver's license, but it doesn't seem to be about, is this a position that the vehicles provided? Are they being reimbursed for travel expenses? We have a vehicle, as you know, that the, the um, district provided for the outreach social worker for times when students are being transported. I think in times where students are being transported, we would need to work out sharing that vehicle. Um, other times when students are not necessarily going to be being transported by this individual and they're just doing casework and visits with homes, it wouldn't be essential that they use the district vehicle. Ms. Voss. Um, two, it, is, the, is this a full-time job is the first question and the second one is how long is the grant promising to fund the position for? It is a full-time position. Um, we can't, I don't think there are any, is any promise of future granting, I can tell you that the last cycle was about 10 years. I guess I'm curious, who's, grant, who's funding it? The federal the government, government, the yeah. state government? Uh, the, the federal government, uh, I believe it's the Department of um, Human Health Health and Services, Human Services, okay. HHS. Thank, that's fine, thank, thank you. you, okay. Mr. Kaufman. So, um, just a couple of quick questions. So on the first sentence, um, by saying must be licensed social worker and DESE certified, is that, just help me understand, does that mean you have to be a DESE certified licensed social worker? Or is, if, if I'm confused with other... No, those are two different licensure yeah. um, 
agencies. This is another area where the ore would have to go into place. So okay. it would be licensed either um, as a licensed social worker or licensed through DESE as a counselor. I'm still confused, but that's okay. If you can make sure that that writing mm -hmm. links up, it just I know there's I know there's a state certification I think to be a social worker, and in addition, is there a DESE certification to be a social worker? The the licensed clinical social worker certification is not through DESE. Right. So the counseling certifications are through DESE. Okay. So it really, if I, if I read it as must be licensed social worker, per, period. I'm oh, sorry, comma. Okay, Jesse licensed or eligible as a school adjustment counselor is the way to read that. The Jesse license piece isn't part of the social worker correct. description. It's part that's of That's correct. Okay. That's I just correct. Had to come in the wrong place. So it is, it is confusing if you can help with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the other thing I just want to say is I spoke to Dr. Provost earlier and I just want to say that I, I find, A, I find this a very exciting position, but this is the third job description we've gotten in a row that I find is just really stale, to tell you the truth. And I just feel like there's, there's such dynamite positions and, and such, you know, the most essential thing we can do is attract a great candidate. So um, we talked last month with Dr. Uh, Plummer about the transition coordinator position. I think we gave her some feedback. She was going to put it in. But I just think we're missing an opportunity here to make these more dynamic, more attractive, showcase and show off the magnificent aspects of working in Northampton and what we bring as schools. And if we, if we can, if we can do that to our advantage, and we'll and we'll look different. And believe me, I know people that are looking for employment, and if they go to School Spring where this is, they're just going to see this. I don't want to lose any good candidates. So long story short, Dr. Provost seemed interested in discussing this further and potentially meeting with some other folks that have more authority over this. And I'm excited that we might be able to have that discussion. And if anybody else feels the same or any have any ideas, please let me know because any moment or any ideas on this might be helpful. Thank you. Okay. I, I think it's a very quick question. I just want to make sure this is fully covered by this grant and nothing out of our budget. That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Any other questions about this? Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to approve this job description. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is approved. Uh, next, we are moving to a report from the Superintendent Evaluation uh, Subcommittee, and um, I will turn it over to the Chair, uh, Mr. Zahowski, to provide us with the, um, the uh, uh, summative evaluation, I believe it is. That's correct. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you know, um, Ms. Burnham, Ms. Kaufman, and myself, Mr. Kaufman and myself uh, made up the subcommittee of the superintendent uh, evaluation. We met three times, uh, as is customary. Uh, at the first meeting, Dr. Provost shares his goals with us, fine tune those. Um, and then, if you recall, at the January meeting of this year, in Dr. Provost, superintendent, uh, comments in his report he shared out what those were with us all um, mid cycle we have an opportunity to meet with dr. provost to see how things are going and then just most recently uh, we met to do the summative evaluation report which each one of you should have received um, so you can see how it's set up there um, in the first section the professional practice goal and the district improvement goals um, were rated as met and with the student learning goal with a significant progress being made. Dr. Provost uh, shared with us uh, many artifacts that supported um, the information needed to make these, um, these ratings, um, as well as conversations that we had where he shared and clarified questions we had around <coughs> the work that we did to, <coughs> to make these ratings. The student learning goal you might see there as significant progress. This has been one of those areas where it's, it's hard to uh, get the data uh, and 
have it available at the time of the evaluation because the information comes in later. Um, but I know Dr. Provost was able to share that he's very excited about being able to share some data with us um, in, the, in the coming months and in, in the near future. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, and I know others are as well, hearing um, how that student learning goal is going in the data that would, would support that. Um, in the other section, um, you can see that uh, the ratings uh, are by standard, instructional leadership, uh, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. In each one of those areas, a rating of proficient was awarded to Dr. Provost. Um, a reminder to the committee and to the public, a rating of proficient is really, um, is really rigorous, and this is the expected of level of performance that we'd be looking for uh, from the superintendent. Um, it shows an understanding of a full uh, fully satisfactory in those standard areas and again um, many artifacts were shared with us in order to reach these conclusions of proficient in going through the document you may have also seen that in some cases there were some exemplary ratings that were given um, the exemplary rating or ranking is given um, in those cases where um, it exceeds the proficient rating um, and this would be um, work that was seen as um, done that could be used as a model uh, or practice regionally or statewide. In my comments, I hope you took some time to read through those as well. You can see that um, I shared in my comments uh, the exemplary findings or the ranking for the work that Dr. Provost had done um, in his uh, MASS, MASC conference, uh, in also for the work that uh, we had in the district with the um, uh, with the with the case study. Uh, uh, So I, I guess what I'm saying is that the, the exemplary findings are, are categorized by work that's done in publications or in um, lectures or going out and, and showing that you're really an expert in, in those areas. Conferences. Conferences. That's Thank the word you. you're trying to pull up. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, so um, if there are any questions or comments that you, you'd like to, to make. Um, Do you want to touch upon the needs improvement? Because there was a. Yeah. Again. Yeah. So in my in my comments there on the on some of the, the things. So like uh, the needs improvement area, uh, in Dr. Dr. Provost, you know, uh, it said that um, when the district review self assessment was done, uh, it identified assessment as an area for improvement. And Dr. Provost believes that uh, the district can improve in its practice by identifying common assessments, by grading subject and adopting consistent practices for communicating the results with the caregivers. Um, and so that would be an area of growth, growth for the district in the future. And so um, although I won't be part of the evaluation team next year, I would imagine Dr. Provost is already starting to think about um, this is one of the areas that he'll be speaking to the committee about. Mr. Coffin. So I, I just wanted to stay and again, maybe just, I, I've apologized to Molly and Ed twice already, but I was sick and I could not make the um, subcommittee that did the review, so um, I just couldn't make it. So I apologize and um, I, I'm a, this is the first time I've seen it as well, even though I'm part of the subcommittee. So one of my questions, don't, don't ask me why don't you know that already, Lonnie, but Ed, I was wondering <laughs> on page three um, where it talks about Dr. Provo's goals and those are not is complete. Those are not complete. You've taken a description of that, and I'm, I'm just. I mean, you've taken a piece of it, and I was wondering if we can put in the entire goal, um, rather than a part of the language, um, because I do think this is a public document, unlike teacher evaluations. Is that true? It is a public yeah, so document. We might look at it, and I think we owe it to him to give him the the, the complete goal. 
so just as an example, and, and I think it crosses all those, but like you and I and Molly talked about to him about why he needs to take his full vacation. And so he rewrote that and shared it with everybody that in order to make optimal use of my physical and psychological resources and to periodically reorientate my perspective, I will use greater a greater portion of my vacation days this year, ideally 100%. So just to use, and, and they all go more than that. So it, it tells the public, and I think it shows John's accomplishments in a more wholesome manner. You look lost. Do you know what I'm referring to? Should I? I, I guess I do. I'm wondering, so you want to have that embedded in this document? Is that what you're saying? Well, I think it, I think it, I would so like to cut, to cut and paste into page three yeah, rather yeah, than yeah. the abbreviated goals. Awesome. The complete goals that John set forth for this year. These are, um, you know what I mean? I know what you mean. So when we meet again, I can clarify that. He, he, he presented his goals in September right. he, to us. He right. revised them, and right. we presented. And we just had never we these had. These aren't his revised goals. Right. So these aren't his revised goals. goals. Then somebody who doesn't have those documents could read the entire yeah. thing, and then what we're evaluating him on. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's on page three of. Is it you're talking about page three? Right. Yeah. The right. Of BA. Okay. Yeah. Items one through six are not complete. There's much more language there that yeah. John. That we rated John on and he accomplished this year. I think we owe it to him to give him a complete goal. And maybe it was a mistake, but I didn't know whether you guys discussed this and it was just a mistake and or, or, that, or not. I just, if that's it's a good idea. Okay. We were going over a lot of stuff, oh, so right. yeah, okay. thank you. But if you agree, <laughs> if you agree, yeah, I think that it's a great idea. I think that we worked hard in that initial meeting on clarifying the goals and bringing and and helping, as you say, to make it a public document so people understand why those are important. And I, I think that's a great comment. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Foss. Um, I, have, I have, I guess, a bigger picture <coughs> comment question, which is the superintendent review, uh, we were told at our retreat earlier this year, this is one of the major things this committee does. And thank you to the subcommittee for all the work you've done. Um, I don't think right now is the time for this. Maybe it's the start of a conversation, but moving forward, I as a committee member would like to play a bigger role getting, and not just seeing this one time a year in August and having conversations. And it's because I think it's fair to Dr. Provost to have everybody able to give input. And what exactly that looks like, I don't know. But um, we were told at this retreat that our system here in Northampton is quite different from other systems across the state. And I look at this 10 page document and I have a really hard time understanding what went into these decisions. So for this part of it, I, I have a couple questions and I don't want it to be taken as I'm disapproving. I'm really just trying to understand it. I think overall the ratings fit with what I would give, but I do have some specific questions. And so those are kind of two different things. One's down in the weeds a little and one is a much bigger um, issue. So while we're on page three, I'll start and I'll probably chime in again, but um, with, with the bigger picture. Um, I don't understand why under two, to meet achievement targets specified in goals under student learning, why there is no rating given there? What's that? Who did you, I'm not sure you're addressing. Oh, anyone. Student two on page three, to meet um, achievement targets specified in this goal. That was the student learning one. And we were, do you want to answer that? Sure. Because the data has not been provided by the state yet. It was based on MCAS scores, which have not been um, produced yet. Okay, so you're... And that happens every year with the student learning goal. Is that a goal you set where you're saying your evaluation depends on how our students do on MCAS? Is that the yes. right interpretation of that? Yeah. Okay. And then I have a few other questions on the same page. Um, three, to take 100% of vacation days... Um, um, I don't, you know, I think that's met, but I'm not sure how you exceed taking 100% of your vacation days, and I'm not, you know, trying to nitpick, but I, I think I would call that met. Well, he said he took he one. He had 10, he, he took and one he took one extra. One extra. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but he gave 110% just like okay. every day in every aspect. Um, I'll just keep going with my questions. So four, um, to revise the code of conduct with a substantial completion by June. Um, I, 
I don't care if this is left as met, but I do want to leave this meeting with the understanding that it has a long way to go. So however we want to interpret substantial completion is fine with me. But personally, I think it has significant progress, but I, th I just want to leave the meeting um, realizing we have a ways to go. And um, I'm curious to hear more about five because I think it's super important and I haven't heard much about it this year to engage educators in discussion of standards-based grading. Um, what are we doing and where are we headed? So we have a, a PLC on standards-based grading. It's led by Dr. Cheevers. It meets on approximately a monthly basis. So we've had more or less 10 meetings over the course of the past year. We are using um, a, a book, I, I believe it's called um, Pathways to Standards-Based Grading or something like that, where they talk about um, different stations on the, the way to get into standards-based grading. Um, we are at about station one at this point, which is, um, which is awareness. Um, one of the things that the group did, it's the part that they actually turned to me for help with most, was um, looking at the validity of some of our current assessment practices. It's also kind of related to my thinking that we, this is an area of improvement for us. Um, so we, we took a look at um, some of the the things that that seemed to be um, driving students' final um, grades as reported on report cards, and there, from the assessment we did, not objective um, ratings of student performance. Um, in fact, when we looked, f when we did the F test to see what the um, relationship between student scores on final exams and what their grade on the report card was, there was not statistically significant relationship. Um, what there was a statistically significant relationship to were things like student socioeconomic group, um, students' disability status, students' LEP status. Um, so. I think we've raised some awareness about the current grading practices being used in the district and um, basically basically been able to, um, I think, at least cause educators to question whether the systems that they're currently using to evaluate students are fair and objective, which is goal one. Then the, the next stations talk about exploring other options, which can ultimately get to standards-based grading. They're all different versions of standards-based grading. You can stop at different levels on the pathway to get there. Um, but the, the first step is basically just realizing that what you're doing is pretty much as random as anything else, and so you shouldn't be firmly holding on to it. That. I'm curious if this is um, across all grades or was it focused in one school, one grade? We looked at um, English language arts, math, science, and social studies in grades 6 through 12. Okay. Is that, are you all set? Uh, On that page, yeah. I'll let other people chime in. Okay. Um, I think you can continue. If you have other questions, if you I'm um, sure. Okay, I'm figuring out what they are. Um, I guess I'd like to understand from the committee: is it it's page five, and partly just so I understand this again, I think this is something we all should um, have some ownership on. Um, to be human resources management and development. Implement a cohesive approach to recruiting, hiring, induction, development, and career growth that promotes high quality and effective practice. And the evidence that I saw uh, for this um, was a PowerPoint given about mentoring and a document that cited the bottom that was from August of 2015. So I just wanted to understand what evidence went into this. You said that was to the committee, but I see the committee looking at me. Do you want me to talk to it? You certainly can if it's, sure. you want to discuss the evidence that you presented for that. Sure. Um, the evidence, um, again, this was an exemplary rating because the exemplary rating um, reflects 
something that could serve as a model of practice regionally or statewide. That document cited from 2015 had to do with our opportunities for teacher leadership, um, which were cited by the state as a model that other um, districts could um, could learn from. We're still doing what we were doing in 2015. In fact, we've grown our teacher leadership options in the district. So that was that was the reason that piece of evidence was in there. Thanks. I feel like I need to start on track and I feel like I need to make a motion. I need, I need to, I feel like I need to make a motion so that the language is adapted to accurately reflect Dr. Provost's goals so that we're not voting on this. We're, we're giving Ed permission to revamp this so it accurately reflects the goals. Getting back to my point before. Sure, I mean, the motion could be to, when we get to the final motion, yeah. it could be, you know, it could be to approve it with the inclusion of the final goals. So right. you could make the motion in that way. So I don't think you have to make a separate motion, but I think you yeah. could just, could, you, you know, preface your motion that way okay. when we finish the discussion. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Are you all? I'm, I'm done just understanding what was here. And okay. so, like I said, for this discussion, I, I wanted to understand what I'm voting on, and I feel like I do, so thank you. Okay. And um, um, I also, want to go to a higher level just to say how do we have this conversation about whether or not this is the right method for us as a committee to evaluate our superintendent moving forward because um, it is so different from what other districts do. Okay. Well, I think that would be something we would have to take up at another meeting, not mm -hmm. as part of this meeting because that wasn't really what we mm -hmm. advertised that we'd be talking about tonight. So um, we'll try to find some space to do that um, between now and then. So. Um, okay, so any other questions about the superintendent evaluation? So, I do think that we, uh, I do think we wanted to talk about the new superintendent evaluation. Is that good? Oh, yeah, that does. If that doesn't fit in later, I'd like to bring it in now. I think yeah, I think pilot. What's that? There's a pilot. There's a new superintendent evaluation pilot. Okay. But do we want to first approve the one we completed, yeah. and then we can discuss the pilot? Just because I feel like we need to not. The only yeah, yeah. yeah. The only reason to talk about the pilot now is that there was um, one area, um, one of the um, standards that um, was specifically extremely broad and difficult to pin down and the pilot um, might help us with that particular goal. Um, so, so there is something about the pilot that could help inform this document. Mm -hmm. um, and it's specifically three, uh, oh no, excuse me, three B, sharing responsibility, which is continuously collaborates with families and community stakeholders to support student learning and development at home, school, and in the community, which is like one of the most hugest <laughs> standards I've ever read. Um, so I don't know if we actually want to, we, we had spent a long time during the evaluation process talking about that and how he could improve that and how he could prove that he's meeting that. Okay. So, um, so I think that pilot had more guidance on it. Okay. And again, we can talk about the pilot once, but I still feel like we need okay, to excellent. complete the evaluation process okay. and then we can talk about what could come next. So, yes. If you'll forgive me. Um, so, when I sit here and look at this form, just like when I look at my own evaluation form, uh, it always makes me remember, Bitzer said, Thomas Gradgrind, your definition of a horse. Quadruped, gremnivorous, 40 teeth, namely 24 grinders, 4 eye teeth, and 12 incisive. Sheds coat in the spring. In marshy country, sheds hoofs too. Hoofs hard, but requiring to be shot with iron. Age known by marks in mouth. Thus and much more bitzer. Now girl number 20, said Mr. Gradrani, you know what a horse is. And I, I feel when I look at this document, and I just want to say this because this will be the last time that I sit at this table and you know when we are evaluating you, which is one of our statutory responsibilities. Um, I have been impressed 
by your leadership, by your deep thinking about education and about its connection to the humanity of, of each individual within the district. Um, I've worked with you um, closely over dozens of hours in, in negotiations and in other contexts, and um, you are prepared, you're thoughtful, and you always challenge yourself to be better. So um, um, I want to thank the team uh, for the thoughtful evaluation that you've given. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that you know the superintendent is, is uh, as we've seen, um, instrumental in assigning those needs improvements because that's his character, which is to um, look for places where the district can be better and when he receives evaluation as he did in the comprehensive district review, to take those things seriously. Um, but overall, I just want to thank you for uh, the service that you provided to the district in the five years since we selected you as our superintendent and um, I look forward to your service. <coughs> continuing and um, and my children and the children of our community will will certainly benefit from having you here so um, mr. Kaufman did you want to make a motion well, sure so I would make a motion that we approve the uh, superintendent's evaluation with the understanding that the actual goals that we approved in January will simply be cut and pasted into the appropriate places uh, on page three. Um, and that we will continue, I don't know if you start, we will continue this discussion. I don't want to end this discussion because we have these documents and other stuff. So if that's part of my motion, we will continue on this topic before going on to the next agenda item. Yeah, you don't have to make that as the motion, but so, but we, we will, you, you have my understanding. Yeah, no, it's, I don't so have to include it in the we'll motion. The, we, will, we'll, yeah. <laughs> we will approve the document uh, yeah. with the caveat that will update uh, to accurately reflect the superintendent's goals for the end. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? Okay. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, so. Uh, uh, Dr. Provost had uh, provided us and uh, handed out tonight a copy of a document um, from DESE, um, July 2019, hot mm -hmm. off the presses. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a model rubric for superintendents and district administrators. And I don't know if you want to just give us a synopsis or give us your impressions. Sure. Um, yes. It was, it was, I think I encouraged Dr. Provost to add it. So I, I think the, the, can I say a couple of things John, before? I, I, sure. I, I didn't want to discuss the new process. I wanted us to discuss whether we have the option of of doing it next year. We, we have three options based on this mass bulletin that came out. And so I wanted us as a committee to, to, give, to work with John to decide whether we want to continue. We have an option of continuing the existing one or piloting this new one or developing our own pilot of the new one. And I was concerned with John developing his goals without him knowing which form and which process we were going to use with this being the only information I had. The reality is John has worked on this with the state and has a ton more information which he's presented here. But I'm conscious of the time. So I didn't want to get into a deep yeah. discussion. I just wanted us to discuss we're going to pilot it. We're going to push it off till September when we have more information. We're going to leave it to the subcommittee. I didn't want this to be a, a big thing, but I'm happy to, and I'm happy you have it, John, but I'm conscious of time, so. Well, I'm also conscious of the open meeting law, so we, because it wasn't a decision that we we said we would be voting on tonight. So I think we can definitely introduce the information, sure. but then bring it back for a, a final decision yeah. and maybe get a recommendation from the committee. Ms. Hennessy? Well, I was just going to say that. The subcommittee meet before the October meeting or before the September meeting, um, I know that's short, but so they can make a determination and report back to us, similar to what the rules and policy would do. Mm -hmm. where we meet monthly and kind of go over all the real weeds of this and then um, report back to us. Because it seems like it's a lot, I mean, and about decisions that I think the subcommittee should do. But. Okay. So, um, so maybe just a quick introduction, just an overview of what this is, and then with the understanding that we'll ask our committee to take a look at it and, um, and, and try to bring back a recommendation that we could have the full committee discuss at a future meeting, at a posted meeting, yeah. Sure, just a few things on the, on the new pilot. Um, I wanted you to have this because um, Mr. Kaufman shared with me the information that was in the MASC bulletin and um, basically just a narrative description. I actually had the, um, the background through MASS. 
Um, there is a five-part video series. You should know there is a five-part video series that goes with it. Um, I am one of the actors in the five-part video series because Northampton's evaluation system has been um, held up as one of the models for the state. So. Um, if you all could get an exemplary in an evaluation, <laughs> you should be getting it. Uh, so uh, the, the main thing is that it reduces the number of um, standards. And it also does specifically address that one yeah, that, um, I know. that Ms. Burnham was talking about. It's the one where I said, I think I have to be, needs improvement on this. The continuously um, works with families. Um, because when you read through the standard on that, the proficient level talks about continuously working with family units to help them um, resolve issues right, that are preventing their kids from learning in school. And that's really not what a superintendent does. Um, and when I had proposed some maybe goals um, for thinking about how I could actually do that, they, I think, wisely gave me some feedback that that might be problematic because if you start to get into that role, then all the rest of the families will wonder why are you partnering with them and not partnering with, with them. So um, the rubric actually addresses that by clarifying what is meant for superintendents under that um, standard. It also reduces the number of standards. And it also um, says that experienced superintendents should um, be on a two-year evaluation cycle like experienced educators. Um, an annual evaluation still on the goal, the individual goals, but two years on the standards. So those are the main differences. I, well, I have the mic would just say that uh, kicking this to the evaluation subcommittee for their review I think makes a lot of sense um, because there is a lot to go through here. Okay. So. Would you like to make a motion that we refer this to the uh, to the evaluation Sure, subcommittee? I'll make the motion that we refer uh, this process to um, the we, evaluation. We, we, we did make a motion. But on the agenda, we can't vote yeah. to refer, right? Yeah. We can vote to refer something. Why wouldn't we be able it to? It doesn't say that we're going to vote to refer it on the agenda. Just, I, yeah, I, I, I view that more as a ministerial function that you're referring something to a committee for study, but we can just put it on your next agenda. So just so that there's no concern about that. But yeah, um, so we'll make sure it gets on your next agenda. We all understand that without a vote. So without a vote, my understanding is this will be on our next agenda. We'll try and do it as soon as possible yes. so it doesn't slow John back. But the most critical piece is that what I heard you say is that we will consider this more deeply, bring back a recommendation to the full committee for That's the full committee's vote with John's input as to whether whether we're going with a new one or or going That's correct. The old, That's correct. Yeah. We just don't want to have any deliberation about it so, here tonight. So, so yeah. Okay. yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um all right. Everyone else everyone okay now? All right now. Good. Excellent. I follow the rule, I think they should follow the rule. That's fine. That's fine. Um, okay, so we uh, thank you again to um, thank you again to the subcommittee. Yeah. Um, Sorry. And I think um, we should make sure we get those. You know, take a look at those videos and take a look at the uh, materials um, for that conversation. Five parts. All right. So. Um, <laughs> So uh, next we have a uh, report of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee, uh, and we'll turn it over to Ms. Fallon to go through a number of second reading and votes on some of our outs, uh, some of our policies that they've been working on. Okay. Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, if you first off, we have uh, policy IJNDB technology and acceptable use it is a second reading that we'll be voting on. You recall. Uh, Student Noah Cassis uh, had proposed a revision to this policy, worked with the IT department and administrators to establish that there is an appropriate procedure to protect student data privacy. Um, and so the changes we made, um, you guys have all seen, um, are on the second page uh, discussing the that our schools have software and systems place that monitor and record all internet usage and the district will make a summary of the procedures governing the use of these softwares and systems public and clear accessible format in the handbook on the and on the district website. Um, the district will intermittently monitor internet network traffic and other usage of electronic resources by tracking destination URLs of individual users that users should 
Users should have no expectation of privacy when browsing the web, sending or receiving email, or using other electronic school resources. The district does provide email accounts for the purpose of school-related communication. Uh, and we also re added in language replacing the uh, school department with the Northampton Public Schools and stating that the rules and regulations would be set forth in the student handbook. Yeah, we're back to this thing where we have we have some duplicated mm -hmm. language here that's not well, intended to be duplicated. Yeah, so can we, I'd like to move to yeah. um, approve the policy as amended. Second. And then we have I amendments. I will <laughs> offer the amendment, which is, um, so that paragraph, which begins on the bottom of page one and goes through page, the top is the first paragraph of page two. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, the part that the part that is not highlighted is then repeated in the part that is highlighted, and then is repeated begins to be repeated again with the last sentence of the part that is highlighted. You see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. See so that? Yep. So my motion is to delete <laughs> um, the part that's not highlighted at the beginning. Sorry, on page one where it reads our it, it, Yeah, so our schools have some. Yep. Delete that through to um, communication. Through communication. And then we will have remaining. Our schools have software and systems in place that monitor and record all internet usage. The district will make a summary of the procedures governing the use of these softwares and systems public in clear, accessible format in the handbook and, I will add, and on the district website. The district will intermittently monitor internet network traffic and other usage of electronic resources, for instance, by tracking destination URLs of individual users. Users should have no expectation of privacy when browsing the web, sending or receiving email, or using other electronic school resources, period. And then, yeah, so then we'll leave th that in because we won't put it in the uh, email accounts. We'll stay there. Okay. okay. Is there a second? second? Okay. So there's been an amendment to the main motion. Um, any discussion on the amendment? Will there be a period at the end? And there will be a period. Yeah. Um, so you have a question, Ms. Vaughn? I, I have, yeah, on the. Yeah. So where, right around where it says handbook, does it make sense to remove the comma after format? So clear, accessible format in the handbook. Um, no, yeah. because it's going to be both in a clear, accessible format in the handbook and on the district website. Yeah, I think I don't, the comma is like, superfluous. I don't think we want the comma there. I don't okay. either. I would, and, and the handbook, the handbook with handbook capitalized, that might not be clear. Is it the new code? It's whatever the uh, handbook uh, is. Because well, this policy will be around, so it'll be. That's fine, but we have this new district-wide code of conduct. Is that the handbook? I don't know what the handbook is. Well, Lots. Hmm? Thoughts so, on that, uh, the naming of the handbook? Yeah, the, the title is likely to be different. It's it's the document that serves that function. Yeah, so we could it's do this. Only, we could do a lowercase handbook because that's right. Because <laughs> it could be a lowercase handbook because that is whatever that thing is. I like that. Okay. People know what that. Is. I mean, that's because that's a legally binding document. The handbook, the lowercase handbook. I think I'm good with that. I'm just trying to make sure I understand it. Yes. Is this the same thing as the code of conduct handbook, or is it a? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I was just making sure there's not another one out there that I don't know yeah. about. Okay. So will you accept as a friendly amendment? Yes. Your amendment. The Lower casing the, the handbook comma. and removing the comma. And okay. then adding and. And adding and. Okay. All right. And and actually, there's, I think, and. Um, two commas that need to be removed: the one after format, and if you're adding the and, the one after handbook. Yes. Yeah. So two commas remove the word and and lowercase h. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. 
All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so now we're back to the main motion. Yes. I'd like to make another amendment um, because this is totally separate. We did look into the question of the internet and, it, and we were given the blessing to remove that. Um, so in the second, um, second, uh, the second sentence of the policy where it says by providing internet and internet access to staff and students, I'd like to um, move that we remove intranet and so that it just reads by providing internet access. Okay. Good job. You have to second it. Second. second. Thank you. <laughs> Don't good job. So there's a motion made and seconded. Um, uh, I was actually with some students the other day um, up in Greenfield and they were working doing the youth works program and one of them was working in an IT and people kept using the term the inner the intranet they were, were actually working at Cooley Dick and they were like I think these grown up you know don't know what they're talking about there's no such a thing as an intranet it's the internet but then they realized there is an intranet but obviously <laughs> it's not something that students are on but it's what yeah. Yeah. anyway so mm -hmm. just funny you mentioned that because <laughs> sharing that. They, no, I just you know, but Good anyway, story. there is an intranet <laughs> um, okay so the, <laughs> there are, there are is there anything else <laughs> Probably also Skynet, but that's, we're not going to talk about that. Okay, so all those in favor of that amendment, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Okay, so now we're back to the main motion again that's been further amended. Are there any more amendments to that? Oh. I'm waiting for them. I have one. If okay. Okay. Um, on the first page, I, recognizing this, original writing is quite old. I think we can make something more clear. Let's see, it's the third paragraph down in the middle where it says, users should not publish their home address, phone number, or any other conf confidential information over the internet. I think what students would understand better and what our intention is, is to say users should not share their home address, phone number, or any other confidential confidential information over the internet. The third paragraph in the middle to ensure personal mm -hmm. safety. Um, Share as opposed to publish? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we mean. Cause you're talking about like publish. Like I mean, it a, says publish. To me, that means you're like updating a web page and it's there permanently. And um, I think what we mean in the policy mm -hmm. is share. Mm -hmm. like email the information uh, or I don't know I mean I'll second that I also wonder like our students are gonna be emailing these things so I you know I, you read this the third time and you start looking at it more carefully and wondering what we actually mean by it that's where I'm at with it but but I think share is a more um, broader it's a more so, modern term I think yeah. back when this was written that other yeah. one might have made sense but I'll second your amendment trying to modernize this, right? So, okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Any other discussion on this amendment? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now we're back to the thrice amended uh, main motion. Um, so, yes. All set? Um, okay. Great. So, no, no, sorry. Okay. Sorry. I, I, um, <sighs> So we have the student handbook in yellow, and that's fine, and it just, it's down toward the bottom of page two. So above where we amended it, we said the handbook, and I just think we should probably be consistent. Um, so you'd like to delete the word student? Sure. Okay. Uh, so there's been a motion to delete the word student um, in the uh, third to last paragraph. I'll second that. Discussion. All the. Um, my only question would be why delete the word student there, but not instead we could just add students yes. to the bottom. I feel like that's more, if we're looking for them to be the same, that I think it's better to say student handbook for both. It's fine. Just yeah. make okay, it so just well, consistent. Okay. Because I, I don't know yep. that it is the student handbook. I think that might be right. right. It, it's, it's like a school handbook that applies to everyone. It's not just students, it applies to faculty and. But the district handbook. No, because it's a school-based item. So what's our pleasure here? I like deleting the student. Well, I'm sorry. Okay. I think that it's going to be a district. 
going to get it. It's changing to a district. So I actually, I sort of think that, I think that the district handbook um, would be the clearest. But since we don't have that yet, why don't we just say the handbook? And then yeah, I kind of like the deleting the student myself yeah. as well. The original motion, if that's okay. You got a second already that yeah. much. Okay. I, I'm going with what the rules committee yeah. people okay. prefer. I, so the motion on the table, the amendment on the table, is to delete student in student handbook to make it match where we lowercase handbook up above. But if Ms. Fallon feels otherwise, I'd be happy to have it amended. <laughs> you would just withdraw your amendment? I, I will withdraw my amendment and ask Ms. Fallon to make a, a new one. <laughs> I, I, I really don't have the sense of the committee right now. <laughs> Good I move. feel like we've got two votes for school handbook, two for handbook, two for district handbook, and I haven't heard from the rest of you. So. <laughs> I'm fine with handbook. Dr. Provost. Me too. So if I, can, if I can try to put my thumb on the scale here. I'll just go back to the title. It says acceptable use policy for staff and students. So I think that we're removing students is a better option here because if there were to be a staff handbook, I would okay. really would love there to be a staff handbook at some day. It should be in there as well. Okay. And that's the so just already so we have rev can we revive her the amendment then? The, uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, so the amendment that had been made and seconded was to remove student. And is, is there any discussion on that? So we're reviving your amendment. Great. Okay. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We're back to the main motion. I'm <laughs> sorry. Oh, no. okay. It's another kind of conflict in terms of the age of the original yeah. um, piece. And I'll start by saying I'm willing to leave it, but I want to acknowledge it and see what people think. And that is under our users, second paragraph, it says, um, unethical or illegal use of school computers or use for other than legitimate or use for other than legitimate educational use will be cause for disciplinary action blah 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 that's fine but i think it's in conflict with some of the expectations for now that we're sending computers home and what they're allowed to be used for over the weekend and I just want to point out we have that conflict that we should deal with at some point. So that's not an amendment, it's just a... Just I don't know what to do about it, but we we are allowing Chromebooks over the weekends to be used for things that are, I think, beyond educational use. Okay. So I don't, you know, that's something to add to our list of moving forward into this new realm of the way our students use computers, it's not consistent with this policy, but okay. it might be more than we want to take on right now. I have no I, idea what to do with it. Yeah, I would say okay. more than we want to take on tonight, but we yep. can definitely take it yep. on in the future. Okay. okay. So, um, all, so we're back to the main motion, as, as has been amended many times. Um, mm -hmm. All those in favor of approving uh, policy IJNDB, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so um, one down. Now we go to 14 Tina. more. We have 14 more to get through, people. <laughs> what are you saying? Pace uh, ourselves? If I was on the city council, I'd need to take this um, route. Next up is <laughs> we have a series um, of policies from Section D. Our financial auditor recommended that we review our entire Section D, which is fiscal management. Um, so we have for a second reading policy DA. Um, which is fiscal management goals. Now I can find it. Um, there are no recommended changes. So I would move to approve policy DA. Okay. Any, uh, any discussion on this one? What will be changed is there will be a. Um, An updated. It, it'll say. Revised. It'll date. say revised. We'll add a date now showing that it got looked at by us. Okay, so there will be some accountability here. Okay. <laughs> All right, so there's been a motion made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Continue. Uh, next up is also a second reading and vote. It's policy DB, annual budget. We added language at the beginning of the policy um, from the um, 
MASC suggested uh, policy saying that the annual budget is the financial expression of the educational program of the school department and it reflects the goals and objectives of the school committee to meet the needs of all students. The budget then is more than just a financial instrument and requires on the part of the committee, the staff and the community an orderly and cooperative effort to ensure sound fiscal practices for achieving the educational goals and objectives of the school district. Um, we also made a change in the second sentence of the third paragraph saying the capital budget is related. We removed strictly um, to capital outlay for the purposes such as acquiring for purposes such as acquiring mm -hmm. land. Right? So yeah. then that too. Mm -hmm. um, as acquiring land, acquiring constructing, adding to buildings, and acquiring new items of equipment. Um, so I would move to I would move to approve policy DB as amended. Second. Any discussion on that one, Mr. Kaufman. So this one, um, maybe I didn't pay as close attention to it last time, but I did want to ask Ann and Howard and, and uh, Laura, this new language on top, which I like a lot, it, this to me could have some significant impacts on our role as a school committee and how we go about changing, going about the budget, um, which I can share with you why I feel this way, but did you have any bigger, was this like a cut and paste and let's move forward, or did you have a, a larger discussion around this? I just want to make sure around this. We had, you remember? Or we did have a bigger discussion yes. about it. But what did we say? <laughs> um, and I thought it was, I think we decided that it was important to us yeah. to, um, to have language about the, the budget essentially being a moral document, an expression of our goals for the district, yeah. um, and, and to, um, to add that in and how that it was uh, the responsibility of the full school committee and the community and mm -hmm. the staff to kind of work together yeah. to ensure that. Yeah, no, I like it a lot, and this was mask. I, mean, I like it a lot. My, I guess what I'm looking at here is um, I don't think our, go I, from my experience, our budget doesn't currently reflect the school committee's educational goals and objectives. Frankly, because I don't think we have educational goals and objectives that are stated that could reflect the budget, that can reflect how we're going about our work. I'm taking those two words very literally. So obviously we have goals and we have diff we have a district improvement plan, and school improvement plan, whatever, but the document we get from John are kind of priorities and we go about funding those priorities, but those priorities don't reflect school committee educational goals and objectives. So when I read this, I see it as a great opportunity for us in the future to take that on, but I do see it as a pretty major shift and a pretty major function that I think we're responsible for, but from my experience, we haven't spent that much time doing it. So am I, um, many, is that how you you're do, Yeah, many committees do have goal setting yeah. sessions in January yeah. of a new term right. um, and talk about what lens are we going to be looking through and prioritizing our budget. Yeah, I would love to do that. I just don't, but I just want to make sure that that's consistent with your thinking because I will bring this up next year and I will look for this sort of things that we have these so that John could put his budget together that is aligned in some manner. I'm not looking over complicated things, but it's aligned to how, how does this respond to our school committee educational goals as informed by the whole community. So I think that's an exciting, positive way forward. And you're nodding your head, so it looks like you guys talked about that, and you didn't see it as a simple language change. As no. it could, it could. I might be wrong, but it could evolve into something bigger uh, and different. Okay, Mr. Moore. Yeah, and I, I think though, I, I think the, the practical reality is that sort of like, you know, I was the, the analogy that comes to mind is is when you make write an IEP, and you're supposed to start with looking at the child and find out, figure out what their needs are, and then figure out what services will meet those needs and in other words that's sort of like that you know start with the goals and work your way that way but very frequently just because of essentially mostly I think it's resource limitations um, team meetings turn into a different thing where they look at what are the possible interventions that the district is offering and then say well, okay which one which one will fit best <laughs> given you know what this child's needs are and so and that's frequently, I think, what, what you're talking about here is when you look at the budget, you sort of see that kind of a process where it's looking at, okay, here's what we've got. How can we make it work? As opposed to what are our goals and how can we fulfill them? 
Does that make is that what you're talking about? That, that I'm, I'm sort of a direction. I, I'm, like I'm direction. saying That's regardless of what I believe or would be enthusiastic or less enthusiastic back, I'm trying to read the language here and I think that this language, if we pass it, puts us in a position next year to ensure that um, we have school committee goals and objectives. Let's yeah. start there. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. that's big. Yeah. That's a big. And I think that's and right. I think that's that right. Drive a lot of things, and if people understand, that's what we're talking about. I think this is. A, yeah, I think this is an attempt to sort of try to set that as a priority ahead of doing it the other way. To try to figure out which way is the cart and which way is the horse. Right. So I didn't understand the analogy to IEPs, but but I do think that we're saying the same thing that. You have that understanding, and I just want to make sure our colleagues have that understanding because it'll come back again if it if it needs to. And, it may, and again, it may not always be possible to do, right? Because sometimes just because of your resources, well, of course, yeah. You know, you right. you know, you, you're left with this: is how much money we have to spend. Of course, right. But we have more of a like. Okay, yes, I, yeah, I understand. <laughs> just burn it. I'm, I'm sorry. I just I, I I don't mean to say this because this this is one thing and the conversation is segued, but I feel like the superintendent does bring up goals, um, inclusion, and um, I feel like actually this is quite aligned with the way that we are working and maybe it's not as um, laid out and clear, but I feel very much that this aligns with the budgets that the superintendent has brought to us. I just want to say that for the record. Sure. So there's been a motion made and seconded to approve this amended uh, uh, annual so budget. then we have this other little technical amendment in paragraph three. Um, Moving down. The capital budget is related to capital outlay for purposes. So we're deleting the word the. Okay. So um, so there's a. I'm offering that as an amendment. All those in favor of eliminating the uh, extraneous the, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, back to the main motion. All those in favor of approving policy DB, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? And abstentions? Okay, so we're on to DBD. Yeah, can, can I ask just a clarifying question sure. about this? So for this sentence continuing it about capital outlay and acquiring new items of equipment, how do we define equipment? I'm sure there's a definition. I'm just curious what it is. I would say that it's um, something that's not land um, or a building. I mean, is it something, equipment and supplies in my world are like, if it's over $3,000, it's equipment. Do we have a definition of equipment? Um, I don't know. Okay. I, I, think, I think usually, you know, when in, in my experience in a college setting, we talk about equipment and supplies, and that's what makes something capital, and I can ask you another time, but I'd like yeah. to know the difference between those for our purposes on school committee. Okay. We typically... There's, the, a, there's a capital threshold. Yeah, we typically, $10,000 and, and above is, um, is generally what we consider a capital item, so that's sort of a threshold, um, and there's things that are just considered to be core basic supplies that don't rise to that level. So we have a we have that in there as Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, I was uh, not getting the I wasn't understanding it originally. Um, so now D B D. Yeah, this is also a reading and vote. It's D B D budget goals and objectives. It's been substantially <laughs> rewritten to read uh, the first priority in the development of an annual budget will be the educational welfare of the children in our schools consistent with the interests of the taxpayers. Before voting to adopt the budget, the committee will scrutinize it thoroughly so that it may be adhered to as adopted. However, the committee recognizes that unforeseen circumstances may require transfers between accounts during a fiscal year. The superintendent will have overall responsibility for budget preparation, adhering to deadlines set forth in the city charter. Period. <laughs> wow, that was fast. This has been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion on DBD? Mr. Cobb. So it's really a question, again, to the committee. But um, you know, uh, w when we go through the budget process, my experience is that the, our current superintendent, who unfortunately will be here forever, is very inclusive and allows us to give our feedback on the budget back and forth. I, I want to make sure that any future superintendents d give us that same thing. So I'm just wondering that a lot of this kind of talks about, and the previous one talks about, we'll vote on it, and and the superintendent will. Uh, take primary responsibility. I'm wondering if you've thought about putting in some additional language that will be shared with the school committee X number of times or 
a minimum of 60 days, back and forth. Some of the best practices that I think we practice now, I was wondering if you felt like that appears somewhere else or whether you consider that as an important aspect to it because it, by leaving that out, it, it sounded like we're not, we're not putting into policy some of the things that I think we do very well for future leaders. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we thought about putting in specifics other than there is a cross, like there's a reference, the source of the city charter, which does lay out when the budget needs to be presented um, and voted upon and approved. Um, but no, we hadn't thought of limiting mm -hmm. it further. You know, I, I think I, I think that in defense of leaving it really open is the fact that John has actually changed the timeline each year, I think, um, in terms of where the point, you know, put where the input should go in, you know, when, he, when he's collected, where he's collected input and from whom. And I, and I think that's been really valuable in terms of you sort of do it this year. You go, oh, yeah, maybe it would have been good if we knew that sooner, or maybe it wasn't so useful until a little bit later. Because, you know, when, when things are sort of very amorphous, it's hard for anybody to make useful comments. And, but there's also a point where it's at the very end where a comment won't be able to be incorporated, right? So figuring out where those places are going to be um, is hard to do and, yeah. and, and so probably don't want to put as like a rule. But, uh, but on the other hand, but on the other hand, your point is well taken that this only sort of says, if, as long as the superintendent meets the deadlines and gives it to us at the end, mm -hmm. which is defined in the city charter, right. we're good. Right. Exactly. And, that, and we aren't good with that. That wouldn't be okay. If we did, exactly. <laughs> we need to talk you about know, that. We in, did in just, the, just the minimum was adhered to, we'd be sitting there going, wait a minute, what about the last couple of months? Thank you. Yes, I think that's my, <laughs> my interest, and, and that's why I wanted yeah, to yeah. You discuss it whether I miss it. And if not, again, I'm conscious of the time, and I don't know the language, but if people are interested, can we add back here, or can we say, oh, you want me to throw out some language for debate, for discussion? Right. Ms. Hennessy? Or, I, I guess I feel like the city charter is enough of a guideline superintendent, regardless of who, who it is, puts a budget that late into the, the, the schedule of the timeline, we could reject it, and that would really go back into the superintendent's evaluation. That I think if we over-prescribe, it's going to be, it might become actually too inflexible. Like when we did the inclusion, that was back and forth, back and forth. And this year was a, a different timeline, frankly. Um, so I think it, I, I'm more comfortable not prescribing it in that detail and then letting kind of the chips fall where they may and we evaluate the superintendent as she or he is presenting the budget to us. That's my perspective. Yeah. I would like to I would like to say that there's also the opportunity for a budget and property subcommittee to call a meeting for the chair of that and to, to say to the superintendent, look, where are you on this process? So I think there are so many, um, there are a lot of different ways that we will control it, but I don't think that I would feel comfortable prescribing it. Uh, very specifically in this policy. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I would ever be into specific, but <laughs> Time I don't even know the language, but let's hear it. Well, and, and you know, in, our, in the previous policy, which we just approved, <laughs> yeah. the pe second paragraph talks about requiring on the part of the committee, the staff, the community, an orderly and cooperative effort. You know, and that's really what we are just talking about, right, is an orderly and cooperative effort on the part of really everybody to generate you know, a budget. Yeah. Ms. Fiancy, did you have a comment? Um, I'm not sure. Well, I'm kind of shifting gears a little, so I don't want to move away comp if uh, Mr. Kaufman wants to discuss. Or do I we guess I'm not hearing a great, a of great deal of enthusiasm, so I don't okay. feel like putting it in there. <laughs> I, would, I would say if, if that I, 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 if anyone else has any input, please. But I mean, I think we, if we wanted to put in language, I think we would say that. Sorry. Budget, the the committee will. Okay. What was your question, Mr. Well, it just seems like that second paragraph just reads sort of, that first sentence reads just awkwardly, and maybe because it is from 2003, but before voting to adopt the budget, the committee will scrutinize it thoroughly so that it may be adhered to as adopted. It kind of diminishes the role of what we really mm -hmm. do on the school committee. We don't just scrutinize it so that we can adhere yeah. to it. We are responsible for the budget and we look at it 
uh, and make decisions on direction and get feedback and revise and you know there's different iterations mm -hmm. so there's something to me that just and I'm not sure that since this is the policy the budget goals and objectives that it has to even be in there I mean, is more in the annual budget and we have some as Mr. Moore pointed out we have some of that language in there anyway so I just feel uncomfortable with that sentence but I don't have a real um, I um, yeah it makes it, it, the, the way I read it ah. is that you're being that's realistic that it's like you're passing something that's actually that you're not just passing something that mm -hmm. can't be met or you know that you, I think that's what they were trying to say it's sort of old style language but um, but Mrs. Boss, did you have a I, I'm tying these two things together. I was quiet because I wasn't quite sure how to get to the words, but tying what I'm hearing from both Mr. Kaufman and Ms. Busanski, I wonder if the second paragraph might be better along the lines of before voting to adopt the budget, the committee will have the opportunity to discuss it at multiple meetings, comma, and or, or just you know discuss it at multiple times and we do that it's not that we don't do yeah. it right but this is the point is that in order to adopt the budget that we're talking about in that first sentence that is actually about the educational welfare of the children and blah 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 in the first sentence how do we go about doing that I think that is what this is about yes okay so um, I just pulled up the MASC policy that they revised um, in 2016, and I wonder if you would all be happier just replacing the entire policy with the MASC policy. Yes. You want me to read it? I would be happy. Because it does exactly be, what they're saying. I would be happier if we referred this back to committee. Why don't we do that? Bring, have you bring it back to yeah. us with some more work, because I don't think we're in a place to do it tonight. Yeah. Fine. I'm getting two thumbs up. That's good. Yeah. Um, so, so I make think it does everything that everyone wants, and it's okay. and, and somebody already did it. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody's already done it. And I think you're all gonna love it in <laughs> That's a that's a cliffhanger for next meeting, everyone. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so I move to to refer this back to a subcommittee. Yes. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, abstentions, okay. So it's right back at you. And then we're on to the DBJ. Um, yes, this is also a second reading and vote policy, DBJ, Budget Transfer Authority. There's only one change in the last sentence um, that said before the end of each fiscal year, the school committee shall hold a vote to grant the superintendent or his or her designee the authority without the above $10,000 restriction to transfer funds to close the fiscal year books. Is that a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. I moved to uh, yeah, sure. approve policy D B D T J as amended. Second. Okay. And this just aligns with our practice, basically. This is mm -hmm. to bring it more in what, what we do. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions about this one? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So D B J is adopted, and now we're on to D D. Uh, policy DD is also a second reading and vote funding proposals and applications. I know there was much commentary last month. Um, so the only change that we had suggested was in the third paragraph um, that the superintendent will be responsible for seeking out and coordinating the development of proposals for all specially funded projects and we eliminated and for submitting the proposals to the committee for approval because we had discussed the time sensitive nature of some of these proposals. Um, so I would move to accept policy DD as amended. Mr. Moore, is there, oh, okay, second. Okay, any discussion? Yes. Yeah, so I'm still um, not in favor of just the overall arching Re not having any way in here for the committee to be made aware of it in general if it isn't time sensitive we often you know we meet at least every month um, for, as a committee member I'd like to be aware of it and not be in a position where um, there's potential resources that we should be talking about that are required um, and, and we talked about this some at the last meeting but it's not just financial it could be time of people that that is certainly part of our budget um, and submitting 
the proposal to the committee for approval, I could see making that less strict, but notifying, you know, I don't know where it was. We got an email somewhere where it said if time, there's some policy that we have apparently where if it's time sensitive, um, the superintendent can email us and if nobody responds within two days, it's fine. I, I can't remember where I read yeah, that. That's kind when I read that, I thought that's the kind of thing I'd be comfortable with in this situation. You know, generally I'd like to know about it, but mm -hmm. if it's a time, you know, and I think normally it would be good for us to approve it, but if it's time sensitive, send an email and if you don't hear back in two days, go for it. So the only thing I would have to say, so on the contracts, I think it is, it's different in that I mean, those have like come with a legal obligation, but for the and so we said the policy that we wrote was that even one committee member saying, you know what, I'm not comfortable with this being an automatic approval. I'd like it to be put on the agenda, but I don't know that I'm as comfortable with a, a funding proposal potentially missing a deadline because one committee member says, you know what, I have questions. Could you put this on the agenda? Do you know what I'm saying? If, it, if it's Most, a great opportunity, one person on the committee could say, oh, I've got lots of questions or I don't know about this and, and holds up what could be a great thing for the district. I, I just feel like there, I, I agree with Ms. Voss and feel like there just should be some way to notify us and maybe the two day, um, if nobody's, maybe that's not it, but we have a certain threshold at which we have to know that schools are spent, you know, above which schools are spending money. I think there's lots of very easy ways to tell us on a very just, you know, on a monthly basis that wouldn't be, I certainly wouldn't want us to miss out on an opportunity, but I also don't think it would, you know, hinder uh, anyone too much to just notify us of what, um, you know, grants are, have been applied to this or something. Like yeah, exactly. Like, I, I don't, Do you typically you know, sign all the grant applications or yes. approve them so they do come through you? making sure that there wasn't like grants being applied for yeah. mm. so would like an update or or you want to have a chance to say don't apply for that grant I, I think it's such a broad thing that it's hard to define right so if you're in a university for example um, you you have to know that it's going to take a week or two to sign on to something and usually if it's a couple days it's these things in my experience, and I'm sure once in a while they come up very quickly, but usually you should know more than two or three days ahead, and you should be able to be planning for it. And and so, in exceptional cases, I don't want to say we can't possibly sign on, so I'm willing to look for some room to be flexible here, but the MASC policy is something that we're going against, and whenever we go against that, I think we should have a pretty good reason, because they've thoughtfully figured out what works for most districts. And uh, my concern is big proposals with that we might want to sign on, and it might be a great opportunity, often have costs associated with them. And it's something that this committee should have a conversation about. It seems like there's two, two places in the timeline of a proposal. There's the before you even bother to, to writing your proposal. You know, I'm assuming we're talking about something like a grant application mm -hmm. or something. There's the first question, should we even bother? Which is, it strikes me as being more the point you're talking about, actually, as opposed to after the proposals, because the way this is worded, this, the thing we're striking, it'd be like, you do the proposal, and then you get our okay to send it in. And that seems really like at a bad place, because the person's already done all the work. And, and then, so, so, so I think maybe it's not about pro the proposal that you want notice of, more as like a step before that even. Absolutely. Um, is that, am I right about so that? So when you say before submitting the proposal, I don't need to see the proposal. I need to know we're asking for before this much money to do this and it's going to cost, it, these are the people that are going to do the work and they're not going to do this other work. Like, yeah, the, I, I think you could interpret it different ways and that first interpretation is what I think we should be doing. That's what you were looking at. Yeah. Some sort of some sort of notice that this is what we're thinking about making a proposal on or, or making an application for. That is at that stage that you want to To go back to the example I used last time. 
we want to be part of the global STEM program. We're going to make this proposal on this time scale. It's going to cost this much money, and this is why we're doing it. That's all I want to know. I don't need to read the whole proposal and know every last detail, but know that that's a priority yeah, but for But you us. want to know it sort of before, before any work gets started on making that global STEM Well, what this says is before it's submitted, so I don't care. I don't care if we know before they start the work. Well, I mean, but it would make a difference. I mean, if, if, if what we're doing is putting the brakes on some, a lot of work that somebody's just done working on an application, you know, we, it seems like if we're going if, if the purpose of this is, is for the committee to be able to do some sort of a, you know, stop work order, it's better if we do that sooner rather than later. I mean, as Brad. I ask the superintendent I just, just to I give. just have to weigh in here with what I'm concerned about if it has a potential chilling effect on the creativity of our staff. Yeah. Because as I read this, there are three types of funding sources that are included. State, federal, and special funds. This is the paragraph that applies to special funds. Most of the special funds that we get in the district are through NEF. So I'm going to be sending out a memorandum to all of my teachers saying, before you even think about applying for an MEF grant, please get the school committee's approval. I don't think that's going to go over very well. And I'm not, sorry, I'm not asking for that. So okay. that's fine. I'm not asking for that. Okay. So, so what would you what's our current practice? Oh, sorry. What's our current practice been? For the NEF? Right. We don't learn so, about it until after they've been right. awarded. So what None happens is teachers, teachers of... Oh, okay, that's fine. I'm just trying to, well, as no, a no, committee, say, yeah. nobody reports out to us on what's being proposed, as it, we have a liaison. So NEF request proposals, teachers submit them, they go to the NEF for um, rating. Before, as part of the rating process, they ch the NEF checks with principals and the superintendents to make sure that it's a project that we could support if they decide to fund it. Then they notify us of the awards and then they come to the school committee to request your acceptance of the awards. And there are school committee members right now, Howard and I both serve on the small grants committee, so we'll get them in advance and then if we have questions, we'll raise them with either the superintendent or the person who's writing the grant. Right, but this is, and for submitting the pearls, so I was just saying it doesn't come to the full committee. I understand there's a liaison on that committee, but it doesn't Oh, no, you were right. just asking what the process was. Right. So I was just saying there is yeah. some feedback from the school committee on, yeah. the, on the NEF grants. Before Which is they, fine. I think that's a perfectly fine process. Okay. I'm not, okay. you know, yeah. I'm saying we're not following the policy as written. No, you guys coordinate the development of the proposals because because all of them go across his desk to make sure that they're somehow consistent with what we're doing. May, may I ask that this get referred back to the subcommittee? I think that the subcommittee understands. No, I, I think the subcommittee is perfectly happy with the policy, the way it was written. It's okay. the full committee that's questioning. I'm, I'm fine with this policy. I, so. I might have a compromise. Can I try it? Um, how do, can I offer an amendment? that says where it's crossed out, instead of saying and for submitting, et cetera, um, it would say um, seeking out and coordinating the development of proposals for all specially funded projects and for um, keeping the school committee apprised. apprised of these and if even if it's after. Just in real, you know, so it's not like a year later you hear about, oh, we were doing that. Keeping the school committee apprised, and that fits our model for the NEF. In a they timely here. fashion. In a timely fashion. We're, we're just keeping the school committee apprised. I, I want the school committee, it, I want it, and, and this isn't about the superintendent. This is a policy that's going to be here for a long time, right? I think he does keep us apprised. I'm not worried about this necessarily, but you, what you don't want to have is a policy that just we never know what's going on because people start talking to you about, oh, that's a great project, and you think, oh, we should have known about that. So well, something so little about keeping us up to date on these, and, and I didn't appreciate the difference between specially funded projects and state and federal, so thank you. But keeping us apprised would, would work for me. Well, it might just be a reference to the gift policy, because, I mean, the gift policy, which is what the NEF is, sure. the gift, um, says that we'll do exactly that. So it might just be a matter of ref referring the gift policy as a reference. But it sounds like you have a very specific motion you want to make to make an amendment. Is that what you're 
saying? Sure. So you were saying that the end My of board offered says amendment is where funding. the MASC verbiage is crossed out to say, um, and for keeping the school committee apprised of such projects. Okay. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay. Uh, Superintendent, do you have any thoughts on that? I think, um, as Ms. as Dr. Voss said, I that is part of my practice. We mm -hmm. do it um, on a regular basis through the gift policy mainly. We also do it on an annual basis through the budget where we list all of the grants. So I, I think if, if you're saying through this policy you want me to continue that behavior, I'm very happy with that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, there's a motion that's been made and seconded to amend uh, and to add that. Um, any other discussion on it? Any other thoughts on it? Okay. Um, it, well, I do have. Yeah. Is it okay? With, is it, I almost think it's. Do we need it? Um, do we need it? I don't think we need it with this current superintendent. So, but what we I'm might need it for the future. We might need it for a future superintendent. Right. That's, that's what I'm also thinking. trying to appreciate, Dr. Provost, and listening to these comments and him yeah. thinking that his practice would never go against yeah. anything that we're discussing right now. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think that's what we've seen. Tennessee. Did you have a comment? I was just going to say, since we seem to update this policy once every 15 years, we should try to maybe beyond Dr. Provost's tenure. Just saying, just possibly. But I'm just not sure if your amendment, Dr. Voss, yeah, if it really gets at, I mean, what I'm concerned about is only seeing it at the time of the budget. Like, that is that is a concern to me, even if we've submitted it and accepted it, because so as I think others have pointed out, our budget process has gone very differently in different years. And this year, I think we started discussing it at 11 o'clock at night, and we gave less than an hour to it. So that's just a lot of information, even though it's a lot of information for us to absorb uh, it, and, and be able to. Um, anyway, I'd like to be. So I don't know if just kept us apprised, if that means a future superintendent could just include it in the budget, if that would really do the trick or maybe what Mr. Moore I think was starting to say was something about more like the gift policy. Well basically maybe we don't even do anything in this policy and just literally the thing would be to have down here um, cross reference to the gift policy and just add that because the gift policy is and that pretty detailed that way and, and lays How off. do you feel about um, that Dr. Provost? Well again um, I think my concern was with the NEF it's also a concern with the PTOs. I need to say that. They're another um, significant funder of the schools through special, what I would consider to be special funding. All of their gifts are covered through the gift policy, so I think the reference to the gift policy would cover most of the special funds. There might be some others that um, are not covered either by the NEF or the PTO. But I really, I, I do think you're going to have not only this superintendent, but future superintendents keeping you informed because those are the types of the things that we consider wins that we want to get in front of the public. When we're able right. to get additional funds for our kids, superintendents are happy. They're not trying to keep that a secret. Right. So, yes. I'm understanding, I think, why I had this confusion, and I'm once again confused. The title of this is Funding Proposals and Applications, and the second paragraph says the superintendent will keep informed of possible funds available to the school system under the various state and federal programs and in what manner these funds can be used in the school system. So when you read this as it's written, to me it is about state and federal programs and that's why I wasn't even thinking about NEF kinds of programs when I read this. And these are big grants that often have other things involved in them. So I think part of our problem is we're putting so much such a range of possibilities in this one little teeny um, policy, and maybe we should refer it back at this point. I, I, I'm just going to say, I, I would much rather vote. I feel like we have had this conversation at the subcommittee level, and we went through all of this, and we felt most comfortable with eliminating that sentence. Okay. 
So I, I hear your concerns, but I feel like I'd rather just have someone make a motion and take a vote. Um, I have a little more discussion then. I mean, okay. so I'm are fine. Are you withdrawing your other amendment? I'm withdrawing my other amendment because now I'm realizing it's a much broader. I'm going back to where I was when I started. With it's a much broader policy and. Um, NEF, I am fine with how we operate. I don't want to put that kind of restriction on anything. These are a few thousand dollars or things our teachers want to do. A federal grant where some other district comes and says, let's partner together and let's spend, you know, all of this teacher time figuring this out and this is how much it's going to cost. And it's a bigger deal. I think that belongs um, as a higher level conversation. And the problem for me with this policy is apparently it covers both of these. And I feel differently about um, things that take real resources, like substantial resources in our district without us having a say at some point. Yes, Ms. Anderson. Yeah. Is our say, I, I don't know this, well, I have an opinion, um, at the budget level and at the evaluation level, and our, we don't have the say as yes, go for this grant, don't go for this grant. Like, is it that it's too much of a micromanaging part of our job, and whereas our job is to say, hey, you should have come to us earlier about that grant because we can't pay the $20,000 that's needed to supplement it. And that would then reflect, like, I don't want, I don't want any committee having to give permission to a superintendent for a federal grant or to be a clearinghouse for it. I feel like that comes out in either the budget process or the evaluation. But I'm not, I'm like 90% there. Like I feel like I have some questions about that. Well, I mean, it's, it's almost like what you're saying, what I feel like you're saying, Susan, is not funding proposals or applications, but actually funding oversight. Like, I feel like that's the word, like, it is a, it is a funding proposal oversight. and I. That's what I feel like I'm hearing you say. Sorry, John. I, I just want to point out, uh, I guess what I see is a problem. As I read that paragraph, this issue of school committee notice or approval was related to specially funded projects. If we want to say that it extends to state and federal funds and then bring in the concern for what is the district obligation, that would wipe out our ability to accept any of our entitlements. Mm -hmm. Special education isn't fully federally funded, but I don't think we want to say no to the special ed funds. Title I isn't fully federally funded, but I don't think we want to say we'll say no to that because it costs a lot of money to try to remediate learning. It's not growth. what this says. No, but, I'm, but what your, your concern was accepting federal money with the, that's not able to fill, fully um, serve the purpose for which the money is given. Like special ed, for example. That doesn't come anywhere close to covering our special education obligations. But I don't, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine any school committee saying, don't take your special ed money this year because it doesn't cover everything because, you know, we have to put in so much to ourselves, you know? But I think she, I don't think that that, I, mean, I think I don't mean to, to speak no, for no. you, Susan, but I think what Susan is saying is that she wants to be kept um, up to date on grants that will overextend, will go beyond the budget. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. You're concerned that we accept something, we get paid for that, but then there's something else that needs to be There's matching extended. funds or there's in staff time. time. Or, or it requires the city to yeah. um, invest in it you know, in some form. And so, so it is oversight because you're asking to have oversight in some budgetary. So I wonder if, I wonder if the, the type of grant activity we're trying to constrain here are grants that would require the committee to amend its own adopted budget. Yes. That, Usually grant, sure. if a grant comes out in October, it, you're not, it's not really going to be a part of the budget till the whole next year, right? And so it's complicated. But still then, if it was a grant that, say, required a $20,000 
you know, in-kind contribution or whatever, that would have to be part of the budget that was presented for the next fiscal year, yeah. which would give the school committee the, the opportunity exactly. to say, no, let's stop. It's not worth our contribution of funds. There'll always be a budget in right. place. In right. fact, the budget that is currently in yeah. place probably, or, or if we get it the following year, whatever, there'll be a budget. Can I say that I think the reason that we took it out as a subcommittee, that sentence, despite the fact that it was the MIC's language, was that it said for submitting the proposals to the committee for approval. I think that the conversation we're having right now is very important, particularly since we don't update these that often. But I also wouldn't want this conversation to happen over every proposal that is submitted. We're closed, 10 minutes. Um, so, so I think that it's also a time element. So I, I do wonder if, if what I'm hearing from you and Ms. Burnham and Dr. Provost is if instead of that saying that language, because I don't think it's the proposals, just say um, and submit any proposals requiring um, um, unbudgeted matching funds to the committee for approval. Yes. So that that would eliminate all of those grants that we apply for yearly. They're like you know recurring grants and federal money and state money that you know we're, we don't need to see that every year. Right, the proposal we take them for because it's in the budget. <laughs> right, take it for granted. And the same thing, the NEF would follow under the. I'm just saying. Um, I could work with that and maybe resources because I think in addition to money, it's people's time. So it would be new grants that would require an unbudgeted expenditure you know, of time. Additional money resources additional. from the district. Except, okay. except, you know, again, back to the thing. I think there's. I think part of what made this, has made this little discussion for the last few minutes sort of tangled and difficult is that there's the there's the that financial or resource sort of oversight question. Then there's another question that's the other one that's sort of there, which is the part, part about trusting the trusting the people who are applying for these funds, whether they're teachers or whether they're administrators who are applying for these funds, and just trusting that that they're willing to, like for example, the teachers who apply for an NEF grant, that they're willing to put in the time. I mean, yeah, sure, they put in some money in the grant to pay them a stipend, but it's not, it doesn't pay them for their time. You know, it, it, it's, um, they're, it, by, by, apply, by applying for the grant, they're sort of asserting that, that they are going to cover that additional cost of their time, and and so just trusting that they'll be doing that, or trusting that the administrator who is applying for a grant understands how it's going to fit into their program, and that they are going to be willing to administer that grant. Um, that's part of they know that when they apply for it, and essentially trusting them. So there's the two parts: there's the financial question and the resource question. Then there's also this part that tangles it, which is the, you know, it's, a, it's sort of about where is it oversight and where is it micromanagement? Where is it being trusting in an appropriate way and when is it being trusting in a way where you get blindsided, right? And, you know, so trusting as in taking advantage of as an oversight committee versus trusting in a real, you know, the way you should trust people who work in the district to do their jobs. And shouldn't have to be every time they do something they gotta check with us you know <laughs> and so I think that's what tangles it is because there's both of those are legitimate questions and they both have you know it's hard to figure out exactly where the line should be drawn so I don't think there's anything about trust I'm not distrusting anyone this is about we go after a federal grant that moves in a new direction that costs us resources um, it should go through the school committee and we have teachers applying for NEF grants. We have a perfectly fine process. It does not need to go through us in the same way. Okay, so it's a big umbrella, but there are many grants that we could potentially apply for that has nothing to do with trust. We get it, we're gonna do it, but if it costs resources and redirects our resources, that's, we're elected to say, we've been reading policies all night. We're supposed to listen to our community and bring in what the community wants. Well. That's part of our job to sit here and say, that's a great thing. It supports what our community wants, or we need a bigger conversation about that. And if it's a big commitment, it's something that should come to us. So um, can I just get a motion to suspend our rules uh, past 11, and I'll hear from the superintendent. So moved. Okay. 
Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. I just want to say I think the committee was on a, a potentially more um, propitious path when it was talking about um, things that might cause changes to the budget versus resources because every single grant that comes into this district is a draw on Cammie's office's resources. You know, they could say no to every single grant we have because it takes time from them to try to manage. So I don't think resources can be the, the standard or else we're done with the grants. Or we have to have this level of discussion on everything. I guess I, also just, I would just like to ask from, <laughs> as you know, just a fundamental legal, if you were going to apply for a grant that was going to cause an expenditure of funds that was different from the budget, you would have to come back to us. That's right, and I'd go to you first because I wouldn't want to get involved with a grant and then not have the budget to I mean, so that's, back I mean, it up. So if you're going to, if, it, if a grant application is going to require a reallocation of already budgeted funds, like we budgeted it for something and now we're going to have to reallocate it, I mean, he would legally couldn't apply for the grant without coming back to us. Some of this stuff is sort of embedded in our authority that he couldn't, I just don't think he could apply for a federal grant that committed us to doing something and committing all kinds of staff to it that was not a part of the budget. So I think that there's a little bit of protection there, but Ms. Pusansky. So does that need to be reflected in this policy or not? Or you're saying it's already taken care of? Well, I'm saying we're the budget approving right. authority and that, the, and that it even transfers within the budget we have to approve. Mm -hmm. So if we pass a budget and then suddenly mid-year the superintendent wants to apply for this great federal grant, but it's going to have to require funding or staff time or something else, then then he would have to come back to us. That would be my opinion. And if he didn't, then, I mean, that would be problematic. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Sorry, I wasn't quite done. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's, I think, good to hear. I also just want to go back to Mr. Moore's earlier idea of just referencing the gift policy at the bottom, because then I think that really would, at least for the specialty funding, or whatever we're calling it in here. Yeah, whatever we're calling it. <laughs> would specially funded projects, we have that reference. And that is really what we, the NEF follow. That's what they, they presented to us. We accept it. That's, so I could make an amendment of that or sort or, but I'd like to hear what other people think. I actually was just going to say I'd like to make a motion that we put this forward with Ms. Busansky's amendment to add the gift policy. Second. So there's a motion to amend to add the gift policy ref cross reference. Yeah, and need to vote on it. To the schools. Okay. Is there any discussion on that amendment? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Okay. Any other amendments? Hmm. Okay. So hearing none, I would ask for a vote on the now amended main motion, which is to approve the policy as um, presented by the committee with the amendment. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Okay, so that is um, approved. Um, next item on the agenda is DH, bonded yeah. employees and officers. This, and this is a first review, right? This is, no, this is the last of ours that we'll be voting. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, mine got kind of blank. Um, so this is, um, the only thing that I would say is the adoption date is the one that will need to be updated. Um, and it changed to a revision date. I'm sorry, this is the word that Yeah, um, so for file DH, um, there are no changes. We'll just have to change the adoption. I move to accept policy DH as presented. Second. Any discussion on policy DH? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Excellent. DIB. So these are a series of first readings. Yeah, these are first readings, so maybe we can read them and then discuss them next meeting. Um, so policy DIB is types of funds, revolving funds. Uh, it, we've revised it to read all revolving accounts must be approved by city council. The list of current revolving accounts will be maintained in the office of the business administrator. 
Um, moving on, next we have policy DIE audits. An audit of the school department's accounts should be conducted annually. In addition, the committee may request an additional audit of the school system's account accounts at its discretion. The committee will consider recommendations made by the auditor for maintaining an efficient system for recording and safeguarding the school department's assets. Um, next for first reading, we have policy DI, fiscal accounting and reporting. The super, we just added or designee to both sections where it says the superintendent or designee will be ultimately responsible for receiving and properly accounting for all funds of the school system. And then again, and added in the language in the third paragraph, the school committee will receive periodic financial statements from the superintendent or designee showing the financial condition of the school department. Um, next, we have policy DJA, purchasing authority. Um, and that reads, authority for the purchase of materials, equipment, supplies, and services is extended to the superintendent and their designees. The purchase of items and services will comply with Mass General Law 30B and will not require further committee approval except when required by law or committee policy. Um, and we added in cross-references um, to G DJH contracts, DJF, local competitive purchasing, and DJ purchasing. Um, next, we have file, uh, sorry, sorry, policy DJF, uh, local. Okay, should we ask questions, questions as oh. we go? Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. So, the purchasing authority, um, can you, why did we remove through the budget making process? Is that a MASC recommendation and we're removing it? Mr. Superintendent? I think it was because the actual purchasing is not done through the budgeting process. The budgeting process allocates funds into different accounts and then the account managers make purchases using the district process for purchasing. So can I ask a specific question? Sure. Um, so authority to purchase equipment, equipment might be computers. Um, uh, we aren't going to hear about big changes in what kinds of computers or the extent to we're purchasing them. They're just some line item on the budget and we're giving um, away that sort of oversight by not having it through the budget making process. I'm not sure I'm totally no. understanding why we're getting rid of that. I think it's uh, my recollection is that so we have like a line item for each school yeah of supplies so, okay. and we don't specify how they're going to divvy that up and because that's you know as we all know it's not an adequate amount of money and so it's the, 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 the principal basically is going to have to decide how to spend it and and that's why we don't do it in the budget process it's because we don't we don't say whether you can spend it on paper or pencils well when we look at our budget, there's a line. Each school has their school-based budget, but it's broken out in terms of things that I would call services, equipment, supplies. We don't just say, mm -hmm. go spend this at Northampton High School. We have specific things. And so through the budget-making process, maybe that's not the correct phrase, but in line with what was budgeted by our committee is the way that the authority to purchase those materials is in line with our budget that we make. Yes, that's true. And so getting rid of that phrase, I don't quite follow the reasoning for it. We extend the authority for the purchase to them with this policy, not through the budget making process. <coughs> okay. The budget making process is if we say, here's how many dollars you have to spend for supplies, say, right? I, I we give them the authority here. So perhaps it should say consistent with the current budget or something. Well, that's yeah. always going to be true. That's what the budget is. <laughs> Ms. Pisansky, you. I was going to say maybe it's based on the, you know, current budget. Yeah. Or in line with something like that. That would be fine. What was the mask policy? Did we? There's reads as part of the budget making process. Mm 
it's a first it's reading, first so reading, people right? have a chance to think about it more. We're not asking to. So we can make amendments next. Yes, you okay. could. Yes. Okay. okay, that's fine. Next item. Um, next up, we have policy DJF. Is that where we are? Local competitive purchasing. Uh, we added a legal reference, Mass General Law um, 30B, um, and that policy um, just affirms that all purchases, whether by competitive bid or otherwise, shall take into consideration the quality of the article supplied, their conformity with developed specifications, their suitability, the requirements of the educational system, and delivery, delivery terms. All other things being equal, contracts shall be awarded and purchases made from a local firm. Um, that was just us kind of committing to the value of shop local, essentially. Uh, oh, uh, I, I don't, is this an MASC policy? They do policy? not have that policy, no. Can I, I, I can say it next time, too, but I think the semicolons are meant to be commas because they're just not sentences between them, and that's minor. But. Remind us next time, please. Sure. <laughs> Next up, we have policy DJH contracts. Um, I don't think there were any changes made to that other than to cross-reference it with the other DJ policies, DJ purchasing, DJF local competitive purchasing, and DJA purchasing authority. Uh, next up, we have policy DJ purchasing. Once again, and adding in language, the superintendent or their designee uh, will serve as purchasing agent. Um, and then in the last paragraph, um, following required bidding procedures and awards to vendors by the committee, contracts must be issued for all purchases in excess of city limits. Um, so we added city limits as. Um, which has nothing to do with boundaries. I know, it reads as boundaries to me. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> I knew you were thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, save any amendments for next time. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, sorry. Uh, and then last we have Policy DK payment procedures um, that all claims for payment from school department funds will be processed in accordance with procedures developed by the superintendent or designee. Payment will be authorized against invoices and vouchers that are properly supported by approved purchase orders. Um, as an operating procedure, the committee will receive lists of bills for payment from school department funds. The list will be certified as correct and approved for payment by the school committee or designee and then forwarded to the city auditor for processing and subsequent payment by the city treasurer. Actual invoices, statements, and vouchers will be available for inspection by the school committee. The superintendent or designee will be, oh, will ensure that total expenditures do not exceed the amount allocated in the budget for all items. The school building administrators will manage budget allocations in their respective school. Um, and we added as a legal reference the Municipal Modernization Act of 2016. Um, and this now aligns with our policy. I mean, sorry, with our practice. Yes. So um, in the third paragraph, I guess you could interpret the second clause differently, but where it says, ensure that total expenditures do not exceed the amount allocated in the budget for all items, I read that as saying, overall, everything lumped together, make sure you don't spend more than you have. And by crossing out the phrase, be responsible for assuring the budget allocations are observed, to me says we're not going to pay attention to how much is in each little bin. And I, I think that's not okay to lose that unless you're interpreting the second phrase in a different way than I am. So I propose that we consider putting back in the superintendent or designee will, and this is what was removed, be responsible for assuring the budget allocations are observed. I mean, that's what we do. We, okay, one th thing is if we did that, we want to change the word observed because that's not clear what that means. 
Um, so, but I understand the gist of what you're saying. So it may be a different thing than a different verb than observed. But the other the other thing is that I think was um, relevant to this in the discussion was that. There isn't a month that goes by that there isn't a request to amend the budget because the budget is a guess and the amounts in each of the line items have to change throughout the course of the year. The school committee does have oversight of that. They can reject the um, transfer requests and the, the reasons for the transfer requests are always given. But um, we didn't want to, to create the impression that a superintendent was bound to staying within the original allocations of the budget passed, you know, in some cases, 14 months prior to the execution of, you know, the month that the superintendent is trying to operate in. Yes. I think I, that's why I like the word observed. It's not saying you're in trouble if you go a little out, but it's saying that you're doing this with the original budget in mind, right? And it, I think losing that phrase and you read it without that phrase, it, it isn't really what you want to do or what you ever would do or you want the next superintendent mm -hmm. to do. Can I, I, I feel like I'm having a flashback to this subcommittee meeting. Uh, and I think that what happened was that the last sentence was the school building administrators will be responsible for observing budget allocations in their respective school. And we thought that adding the word manage sounded more appropriate for what they're actually doing. And so once we changed manage, we were like, well, we need another, a more active verb in this paragraph above it, too. Because observe just sounded like hands off, like we're watching it happen. And so I think that that was the progression, but now that you're making your point, and granted it's very late, I, I understand what you're saying, and I would be fine with changing okay. it back to. Well, no, no, but back to. I think we should come up with better. That's just first reading. First bye bye, guys. First reading. So. <laughs> okay. Moving right along. Do you, anybody make a note of that? Um, I didn't write it down. No, I'm trusting. Dr. Voss to remember that. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. Okay. Hopefully I'll so, <laughs> not be ill or not here for some reason. I'll remember it. So Thank that you. was Section D. Um, <laughs> there are actually a couple more still lingering that we're working on in subcommittee. Okay. Um, but next up, and I feel like this is going to be a tougher sell than it would have been three hours ago. <laughs> so through this <laughs> through this process, this, because the because it was recommended that we review all of these policies. Can we just make a vote. Can we just make a motion to refer these two policies to the committee yeah. for review? Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I just want I to be clear. Like we decided this process. I know it's painful and time consuming, but we felt like it was valuable. So could we do this for section A and B? That's what we were asking that you refer them to us so that we can do this comprehensive review. So moved. Second. <laughs> yes. Okay, there's, there's Party 12 school. motions <laughs> seconded 18 times. It's it's yours. All those in favor, please yes. say aye. Aye. Opposed. I, think that's I have one more thing on my... I feel like you guys rushed me just because I'm at the end. <laughs> oh, you're not at the end. <laughs> you believe in it. Next. Um, so it, um, it's come up whether or not uh, we're currently operating with our school resource officer has um, a, a memorandum of understanding um, as far as uh, their relationship with the schools and um, access to student information. And so we're just asking that you refer the question of whether we need an actual policy or whether the MOU that we're using is enough. Um, to the subcommittee for referral uh, for review, and we'll be meeting with um, school resource officer um, Wallace and um, most likely with Chief Casper to discuss the whole question of whether we need a policy. So moved. Second. Oh, I'm not supposed to say second. Second. Okay, <laughs> okay, there's been a motion made and second for that referral. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Abstentions? Great. It's been referred. Um, thank you so much to the committee for all your thank work you. and all these. Thank you all. Yeah. yeah. Thank thank you. It's amazing. Um, business administrator's report. Okay, so in your packet was your business report. You had three warrants that were signed by your representative. Um, I don't have any gifts from the PTO up in July. Okay. Um, and so you're starting underway. Um, 
personnel report for June and July, although it has changed quite a bit as far as new hires. Um, right now we've had two new hires during June and July. We've had three transfers and 34 separations, which includes eight retirements that take care of the personnel, although there have been a number of people hired in the past few weeks that will be coming in the next month's report. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, and next there's a discussion and vote, um, which is related. I believe the superintendent gave us some background on this. This is to authorize the superintendent to award a bus bid uh, to the lowest responsive bidder. Um, there was a technical problem with the last bidding process. Somebody, the low bidder, hadn't um, completed all the information, so we decided to throw everything out, rebid it, and so we're asking for the superintendent, just in the interest of time, to be able to um, authorize them to award the buzz bid to the low bidder, which is you know what the law requires us to do. So, is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, and that leaves us with the superintendent's report. So, I think this is kind of a good one. It's got. <laughs> it's got. Sorry. Is it pictures? It has folk music. It has biblical allusions. Okay. Um, and it it even has Greek, but. I, I, it was sort of always predicated on a vote happening earlier tonight that didn't happen. And I think because it didn't happen, we'll probably have a larger audience for the next meeting. So I would, I would just um, put this on hold to the next meeting, if that's okay with everyone. Okay. Excellent. Um, so we have some future business uh, and meeting dates, which you can read all about on your agenda. Um, and I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? A second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Excellent. So the meeting of the Northampton School Committee is adjourned.